We are live with today's pre-show for our Core 2. That would be our 220-1102 A-plus study group. Hi, everybody. Hey, chat room. How's everybody doing? We are just getting started. You can see we're sort of getting everything in its place, making sure that streaming is working, cameras are working, recordings are working. We're, we're sort of got the, the gist of getting everything working. Uh, the real challenge is keeping it that way. So I think we're in good shape right now, though. We're in, we're in a, not a, a difficult mode right now. Hey, chat room. Hey, everybody. Good morning to everyone. I guess it's morning where I am. As, as they would always say, uh, almost annoyingly, on all of our corporate, uh, corporate conference calls, whenever we would have an all-hands worldwide conference call, there would always be that manager, and you know who they are, who would say, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. We, we understand the concept of time and space. We got it. There's people in different time zones. We, we're with the program, but they always have to say it. So to my chat room, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. There you go. So that's, it just sticks to you. It sticks to you like, uh, like you, would, you would expect to, it to be sticking. Right now, 80 degrees. 80, can we see that? Does that zoom? It does not zoom. 80 degrees. You can see it over my shoulder, though. There's the 80 degree mark. Um, <clears throat> what else do we have listed here? Oh, it's snowing where Drew is. Drew says it's snowing here. Um, not snowing so much here at 80 degrees. It's supposed to get up to 87 Fahrenheit today. So uh, that works out. Uh, some folks uh, checking in the chat room. Thanks for being here. There's uh, what's the temperature in Queens? 60 degrees in Queens, New York City, in the borough of a Queens. It is uh, a nice 60 degrees. It's kind of nice. That's a good temperature. And it's 60 degrees in Southern California. Is national holiday tomorrow in Florida? Well, in the U.S., it is not a national holiday. In Florida, it is not a state holiday tomorrow. Tomorrow's Good Friday. It's more of a religious holiday, but in other parts of the country, there are states that take that as an actual state holiday. But I don't believe yeah, I don't believe it's a federal holiday. Uh, a lot of people are going to be off and just relaxing or uh, having their own um, religious celebrations or whatever whatever you like to do. I will be in the studio typing things because that's what I do. I sit in here and type things. So when I'm not here in front of you or behind you or in front, however this camera works, uh, when I'm not here, I'm, I'm in front of you now. Hi. Uh, that is, um, that's usually me in here when the cameras are off. It's exactly the same. There's nothing different in this, this setup. This screen actually comes a little closer to me because everything's on, on arms. So everything gets moved over closer to me uh, so I can really see quite well. And then I, I work on content. So that's what, that's what we do. 76 degrees in Sao Paulo. That's, that sounds pretty nice, pretty, pretty comparable to where I am right here. 58 in SoCal. How long are the test vouchers good for? Well, it would depend on where you purchase them from and what the, there are some places that can sell vouchers for shorter time frames, but all of the vouchers that you would purchase on my site and indeed all of the ones you would purchase directly from CompTIA are generally good for a year. That means you must complete your exam within that year. Doesn't mean you have to schedule the exam in the year. You have to schedule and complete the exam in that year. So be very careful about those dates. I've had people purchase vouchers on my site and then they don't use them. And after a year, they come back and say, hey, this doesn't work. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's good for one year. You have to use it in a year. So if you're close, go ahead and, and, and do that. Make sure you get your, so your exam set aside. Or I know technically... The terms of the vouchers do not allow you to transfer those vouchers to someone else, but there's no way to track whether the voucher was transferred from someone else. Vouchers aren't associated with your name or anything else. So you may have someone else that can take the exam. So that's it. Or as the chat room is saying, just wait to buy the voucher, which is probably the best idea. Just wait. The only reason I would probably say buy it now is there are times usually the end of the year where the price of the vouchers goes up. They tend to increase the voucher prices every year at the end of the calendar year. So when that happens, 
you might be able to get a better price in December than you do in January. They did increase prices this year, but it was like 3%. It wasn't dramatic. Um, so that's up to you. 3% though of $300 is, you know, that that's, that's some money. Now we're talking a nice savings by purchasing it. Uh, but there you go. You've got some options. That's, that's, I don't know why people buy it so far in advance, but sometimes they do. Um, and, and when you start getting uh, CompTIA books and vouchers and multiple vouchers, especially for A+, now it, it really does stack up. You can, you can do something else with that money. Uh, the vouchers on my website are good to take the exam in the U.S., Canada, or most U.S. territories. So that's, that's the way it works. Uh, there, there are ways to offer vouchers for other countries, but it becomes complicated for revenue recognition, which is sort of the, the corporate term of that. Uh, revenue rec, rev rec, is I'm buying, if I sell the voucher in uh, British pounds, in euros, in Australian dollars, how do I get that money? I, I realize there's a way to do this, of course. I'm, I'm, sort of giving you the idea uh, of what we go through when we're thinking about this. How does that money get from Australia or the EU or UK back into uh, U.S. fiat? And how do we do that without uh, taking too much of the margin away? And how do we do that in a way that is acceptable to uh, the tax taxing authorities in both locations? And that's where it starts to get a little bit squirrely. Uh, which is to say it happens to get a lot squirrely. So that's what it is. That's what's going on. Uh, back in the 60s and 70s, ARPANET was restricted to military. Yeah, ARPANET was uh, was built by the military. So yeah, there was there were some restrictions there. And then it started to get, you know, when at that time, networking was a very unique thing. So not everybody could plug into it anyway. It was restricted to the military just because the military is the ones that had all the money to be able to put this together, connect everything up. And then we had to find ways to standardize on our networking, which is how all of our existing standards exist these, these days, because everybody was trying to do something different. We all had to, to sort of sit together. We created in our industry an entire trade show called Interop. Um, Interop no longer exists in its current form, but Interop which stands for interoperability, was literally a trade show where they would put an internet, a, a, a cable down the middle of the room. Think of it this way. Interop would put it down the middle of the room. Uh, manufacturers would bring their equipment into the room, into the trade show. They would plug it into this backbone cable because at the time it was coax cable that Ethernet ran on and see if all of the devices on that network could talk to each other to see if interoperability was achieved. Uh, Interop ultimately ended up being a much bigger thing. It was a traditional trade show uh, once it got a little larger. But it started off as a way to make sure that if Intel or Apple or Microsoft or anyone else created hardware and software, that all of those would talk to each other over these new new networking standards. Um, and that was that was a great way to see, does it work or not? Let's bring equipment in. We'll make that happen. That's, that's the way it goes. Uh, how are we on time? A uh, minute. We got a minute to go on time. Let's at least get a few things started here. Got a green light today. Yep, fixed it. That's, that's how it goes. Last The last study group on Tuesday um, was pretty interesting because I didn't have my what's coming up next slide. Um, but we worked through it. Worked okay. I think Interop eventually was integrated in a Comdex, maybe. I'm trying to think back. It was a long, it was a long time ago. Oh, Interop. Uh, and I think eventually it, it, uh, it merged or became its own thing. And I don't even know if they still do the, that type of trade show anymore. And you know, trade shows are, are sort of in a weird place now too, aren't they? We're not quite sure because we can do so much uh, online. Well, look at that. You know, unnecessary, but uh, so, so appreciated. I won't say unnecessary. It's, it's very necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony, for your support of the $5 Super Chat. Uh, Anthony says, trying to contribute for every live session I view. Thanks. Well, thank you. That That's actually quite nice uh, and quite a nice thing to say as well. 
Um, and, and by completely unnecessary, I mean no one is required to provide any super chats or anything, but it absolutely is appreciated. Thank you so much, Anthony, and we appreciate you, you being back. Um, yeah, there's a lot here going on. Uh, so as we are here and got this a lot going on, let's see if we can get a live show started because it is the top of the hour. Let's uh, shift back over before I do that. Let's close the chat out so that it will show back up. Well, actually, I don't want to close it out. I want to put it on the other screen. So let's drag it over here. There it goes. Let's put it on the right side. Let's put this on or on the left side, on the right side. It's time to do a live show, everybody. Here we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the April 2023 Professor Messer CompTIA 220 1102 A plus study group. This is our core two A plus study group. We do one of these every month where I ask you questions that come directly from the CompTIA exam objectives. And here in this first hour, we're going to see how well we know the answer to these. You'll be able to follow along online. So feel free to follow along as we go. We have a lot to go through today. Before we get started, let me tell you how you can participate if you are here live. One of the best ways to do it is to pop open a new browser window and visit the URL on your screen. There it is, professormesser.com slash QA is the URL. There'll be a question waiting for you. If you don't want to use a browser window, you'd rather have an app for this. Of course, there's an app for this. It's called the Socrative Student App. And if you use that app that you would download from your favorite app store, you can download that and use it, and it will prompt you for a room name. That room name listed there is Professor Messer, all one word, P-R-O-F-E-S-S-O-R-M-E-S-S-E-R. -E -E and if you do all of that, there will be a question waiting for you. It's actually a question from last month. We usually don't do replayed questions. These are all new questions that I always do on the study groups. So every month is something new. But the very first question, just to see if you can get into and answer the questions, is our rewind question. And it asks, a security administrator has removed malware from a system and has enabled system protection. Which of the following would be the best next step? Would it be schedule scans? Verify malware symptoms, educate the user, update AV, or quarantine the system. Now, if you think you know the answer, our standing rule in the chat room is to not answer the questions in chat, but instead answer the questions by visiting this URL that's on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA. If you do that, the question will be waiting there, and you can put in your answer to the question. You can see folks are already answering the question in the chat room. You can see the numbers are going up. As we go now, please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room either. We'll come back to this question in just a moment. There'll be plenty of time to go over that. But I want to thank you for being here. We do one of these study groups every month for the 1102. Two days ago, we did one for the 1101. You can, of course, go back and look at the replays for that. And then next week on Thursday, we have a Network Plus study group. And the week after that is a Security Plus study group. You can always find out about the study group and when the next one is going to be on the website, we have a calendar at professormesser.com slash calendar. In the meantime, you can, of course, go to professormesser.com slash YouTube. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, that'd be a great thing to subscribe to. Also, our Twitter and Instagram contain our daily A-plus pop quiz questions. And both of those are the same question, just in a different format. Twitter will just be a text-based and a link. And then Instagram shows you the whole question with pretty pictures, which is how, how these things normally would work. So feel free to subscribe. Uh, be, be sure to check those out during the week. Maybe we'll ask a question that's going to help you on your exam. Also want to let you know that the exams right now are called the 220-1101 and 220-1102. That's the version of the exams that are currently available. They were released on April the 20th of 2022. So they've been out almost a year now. So I can't believe it's been almost a year since they're released. I, I feel like we just released those, which means that if you look at the time frames, usually they stick around for about a year and a half or three and a half years, which means the estimated exam retirement date would be November 2025. 
which is great. If you are someone who is planning to take their exam, you're watching this video and wondering, is CompTIA going to change things on me? No, you got plenty of time. November 2025 is the estimated time frame. And we'll give you a much better idea of when those retirement dates might be, usually about six months before they happen. CompTIA will tell us all about it. These are two separate exams. Both exams are 90 minutes long. On the 2-2011-01, you need to score 675. On the 2-2011-02, you need to score a 700. So a little bit more points that you need on the 1102. The scale between those is from a 100 to 900 score. I know it's a little unusual, but that's the way they do it. In, in the meantime, uh, just don't worry so much about the scoring. It'll turn out to be whatever score it is at the end of your exam. Your focus should be on learning those exam objectives and knowing everything that's listed in that list of objectives. Once you pass your exam, of course, your, your exam, your certification, for A plus is good for three years. You can, of course, renew that as you go without having to take the exams again. So this will probably be the only time you take the A plus exams. You'll never have to take them again. You can simply renew your certification every three years, and you're in good shape. The exam itself has two different types, the 1101 and 1102, the core two exam. So today I'm going to ask you questions about operating systems, security, software troubleshooting, operational procedures, and potpourri. We'll focus on all of these, and I'll tend to step through multiples of these as we go through this today. Of course, there is a replay of this available immediately afterwards on YouTube if you'd like to watch the video version of this. I also have an audio-only replay that I post in podcast format, usually the same day or the day after. You'll find it on my website at professormesser.com slash podcast. And if you do that, uh, you'll also find their A-plus podcasts, Network Plus, and Security Plus study group podcasts all listed there. You can add them to your podcast listening program. They'll automatically be downloaded to your computer, and you can use them for uh, uh, wherever you happen to be. Even if you're offline, they were already downloaded when you were online. So it's kind of nice to have those in your podcast listening program. As I mentioned, there is the video rep replay available immediately afterwards. Uh, my marketing manager, Lori, is watching the replay of this right now. Hi, Lori. She's going through and making sure that all of the timestamps in the YouTube video description are added. You can look down the YouTube video description and simply click on any part of the study group, and you'll see that you can visit that particular link very quickly. So it's very easy to find exactly what you're looking for. Um, if this is something you, you can use, you can go back years in our study groups and find exactly what you want and go right to it using these timestamps. So thanks, Lori. We've also got 24 by 7 chat room available. It is our Discord server. You can go to professormesser.com slash Discord and join us there. There's usually people in there all the time that are talking about their A+, their Network+, their Security+, and IT in general. There's usually a spirited debate about uh, Vim versus Emacs or some other type of editor. So we can all fight about our, our favorite Linux editor uh, in the general chat. And then we can jump down to A+, plus, Network+, plus, and Security+, plus to study. It is a fantastic community with some great people there. Please have a look at professormesser.com slash Discord. Also let you know that eventually you will have to take your exam. Uh, I guess you don't have to, but you really should. Uh, and if you do that, you will need to pay for the exam. These things have a cost associated with them. You could, of course, go to the CompTIA site and schedule your exam and pay full price for this. Or you can go to professormesser.com and purchase one of our discounted vouchers that you can use to pay for your exam over on the CompTIA website. Those vouchers are available for test takers who are physically located in the U.S., Canada, or many U.S. territories. They're all listed there at professormesser.com slash vouchers. Also let you know that if you buy the vouchers from my site, you'll get something you can't get anywhere else, and that is our Exam Hacks ebook. I've taken 20 to 25 industry exams throughout my career, probably more than that now that I'm thinking about it. And there's all kinds of tips and tricks you can do during the, the study phase, during the exam itself, and even afterwards. We'll talk about that in my Exam Hacks ebook. I've summarized these tips and tricks and maybe can help you get a couple of extra points on the exam. That comes with your voucher absolutely free if you purchase the voucher at professormesser.com 
slash vouchers. Let's go back to that question I asked earlier, which was, a security administrator has removed malware from a system and has enabled system protection. Which of the following would be the best next step? Would that be to schedule scans, verify malware symptoms, educate the user, update AV, or quarantine the system? Let's see how you answered this one. You can see that 46% of you say educate the user. We've got 27% that say schedule scans. We got 15% that said quarantine the system. And then single digits at 8% for update the AV and 4% for verify the malware symptoms. Well, if we have already removed the malware, We've enabled system protection, which means we've turned on the system protection capabilities that allow us to rewind back to a previous configuration on our system. The only thing we really have left to do is talk to the user about the malware, how they think they may have gotten the malware, ways to prevent them from getting malware into the future. And this, of course, could be a one-on-one -on -one training. This might be training for everybody in the company. It just depends on how this should be implemented and the ways you would like to approach this educational process. This is the last phase of the malware removal process. So once you've done everything else and turned everything on, the system is back up and running, we can turn on system protection, which is one of the last things you do. Once you know the system is already set up to prevent any additional malware, we can turn that back on and then talk to the end user about correcting that issue. So that is the answer we were looking for. Answer C, educate the end user. And about half of you chose that one, which is a pretty good number. We would not schedule scans. Scans are usually scheduled, and all of the things you would set up on the system are ready to be scheduled prior to enabling system protection. System protection is one of the last technical switches that you turn, if you will, on the system. So that's what we would focus on, is after everything is working, we can turn system protection back on and talk to our end users. Those are your last two steps you would run into in the malware protection process or the malware removal process, which has its own concerns, of course. But I talk about those in the video series anyway. Well, that is a multiple choice based question. You're probably familiar with these. There's a question and then there's multiple choices to select from. But at the beginning of your A plus exam, there's a handful of questions that you will get that will not be multiple choice. There'll be almost any other type of question you might expect to see. It might be a matching question. It could be a fill in the blank. It could be a drag and drop question. Maybe it's one where you have to uh, select from a pull down menu on different parts of the screen. But the point with these performance-based questions is that they are not questions that are multiple choice. But everything in the performance-based questions are topics that come directly from the exam objectives. If you think of it this way, don't worry about how they're asking the question. Worry about if you know the answer. Because it really doesn't matter how they ask the question if you already know the content. They can ask you to drag and drop. They can ask you A, B, C, or D. They can ask you to do a fill in the blank. Doesn't matter if you already know the content. So my recommendation to anybody looking at figuring out the performance-based questions is not to dwell on how the question is being asked, but instead dwell on the exam objectives. Everything else will take care of itself, I assure you. I have for you today a matching question. So here is your brand new performance-based question of the month for Core 2. This question asks, match the function to the Windows 10 utility. Some of these utilities will not have a match. So you notice I have seven different utilities here and four different functions. So there will be some that are left over there. So we've got uh, these I'm going to start with the different functions. The first function is add an account to backup operators. The second is disable a background process. The third is disable a wireless keyboard. And the last one is view 24 hours of a server's CPU utilization. Now, I have for you seven different utilities to choose from. So what utility would you use to perform these four different functions, there should be four different utilities you choose from device manager, event viewer, local users and groups, task manager, system restore, performance monitor, or services. This could almost have been a fill in the blank. 
but I think that would have made it a little bit too hard. So let's, I did want to also focus your efforts on things that you would normally see on the exam. And we don't commonly see on the exam questions that are fill in the blank. We usually see matching or multiple choice or others that are very similar to that. So this is a very good representation of the, the style and type of matching question that you could possibly be asked as a performance-based question on your exam. So have a look at those. For those of you listening on the podcast, let's talk about these again. We want to match the function to the Windows 10 utility. Some utilities will not have a match. The different functions are add an account to backup operators, disable a background process, disable a wireless keyboard, or view 24 hours of a server's CPU utilization. And again, those utilities are device manager, event viewer, local users and groups, task manager, system restore, performance monitor, and services. If you think you know the answer, here's your link to lock in your answer, professormesser.com slash QA. Please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. We're going to see if we can remember what all of these might be. Let's see if anyone's, yeah, a number of you have, have plugged in your answers. I'm going to view these answers here. If you think they're already in the right order, all you have to put into the answer page is 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D, and you're done. Now, I will tell you it is not 1A, 2B, 3C, and 4D. It is a little bit different than that, even though it's April. So that's one that would be good, uh, that you would know where exactly these match up to. I have selected on my list a couple or two or three or four, so we can see where these might match as well. And if you want extra credit, you will have three tasks, three utilities left over. What tasks would those utilities allow you to perform? So it should be, you can reverse this in your mind and sort of work the other direction. There's three left over. What do those three do? You have to know them anyway. All of these are listed in your exam objectives. So let's step through each one at a time and see how we do. We'll start with the very first one, which is add an account to backup operators. That would be the local users and groups. The backup operators is a group that is inside of Windows. So going to local users and groups allows you to add and remove users from those groups. Second on your list is services. Oh, that would be matched with disable a background process would be G services. So if you go into your Windows system, there are a number, I would say hundreds of different executables that can run in the background that you never see. There's no user interface or program you would run to be able to see them. They simply run in the background, invisible to you and everyone else. And the way that you control those is through services. That's the important part. So the services is what you would choose for all of those. Uh, that's also a good way to restart a service or a background process. You can change the way the service is configured. You can modify the service and how it works. There's a lot of different ways to do that. So we can talk about background processes and services and how that would work. In fact, somebody brings up a very important point with services we're going to talk about in just a moment uh, in the chat room. So we're going to sort of break that down. Uh, let's uh, go to the next one, which is disable a wireless keyboard. Disabling a keyboard or any other type of hardware on your system can be done with a device manager. Device manager allows you to do that. So there's some advantages to making that happen. And on your system, we need to be able to manage hardware or at least the way the operating system interacts with the hardware. Device manager is exactly where you would go. So if you need to load a new device man, uh, device hardware driver, you do that in device manager. You want to do that in... Um, in a, in a uh, enable or disable uh, a printer or a keyboard or a video display or a storage device that can all be done inside of Device Manager because that's your link to all of the hardware. That's where we put it all together. And on the fourth view, view 24 hours of a server's CPU utilization. Well, CPU utilization is something we can easily see in Task Manager. But one of the things that you will often find uh, as you look at Task Manager, as it shows you this information really in real time, we get these one second updates in Task Manager. It's more of a real time view. You wouldn't leave Task Manager up 24 hours and then somehow try to figure out what the utilization was during that time frame because Task Manager just doesn't track that. Instead, we have Performance Monitor, which is designed for this very task 
being able to go through the process of looking at different metrics that are on your system, whether it's memory utilization, CPU utilization, how much memory is available, how much storage space is available, how many input and output transactions are occurring in a single second. Just there are hundreds of different metrics you can measure using Performance Monitor. And more importantly, Performance Monitor will track it over a very long period of time such as 24 hours. So that would be a perfect one to use for this. That is the best option, performance monitor. And that's what I would recommend that you have a look at as well. It really works quite nicely for this. And if you're trying to find a problem that happens uh, just occasionally, it's not one that tends to happen a lot, then performance mon uh, monitor is going to be really, really useful to be able to do that. That means there are three services or three functions, utilities, that we did not choose on our system. One of these is Event Viewer. That was option B. We didn't have any other functions in here. But if you were going to work with Event Viewer, you may notice, of course, that uh, Event Viewer shows you a lot of information of what's on your system. So if you're looking for the detailed logs of system, application, security, or any other part of your operating system, trust me, it's inside of your Event Viewer. There's lots to go through. In fact, if you're really good at filtering Event Viewer, you'll be very good at doing your troubleshooting because Event Viewer has so many hundreds of thousands or millions of lines of information inside of it. You really do need to, to narrow it down. And being able to use the filter inside of Event Viewer is really a game changer. Uh, Task Manager, we spoke about earlier. Some folks were saying, wait, disable like a background process could be services or task manager. And in this case, I'll accept either one of those. I'll show you why in just a moment. Uh, task manager is certainly available to be used for this. A lot of these utilities in Windows are starting to merge together. And that's a very good example of one that is indeed merging together. Oh, and system restore, uh, the last option that we have here, we even talked about system restore earlier, is that system restore is one that does work exceptionally well to track changes on your system and allow you to effectively revert back to a previous system configuration without losing or changing any of the data uh, that you've stored. So if you have documents and other types of things, that's that's exactly where we would go through. So very quickly, let's bring up our Windows 11 here. I just want to give you a feel for this. There is inside of Windows 11 quite a bit you can do uh, on the system, being able to work through all of the different options that are in Windows 11. And for those of you that are are looking at this, there was a question, by the way, before I get into Windows 11, there was a question here about being able to, um, to pick some of these correctly and some of these incorrectly. Uh, that's a very good point because working through uh, these, you could possibly get some type of, of partial credit. CompTIA does, in some cases, provide partial credit. The problem, though, and the issue especially as it relates to partial credit is they don't always give you partial credit. So this is a situation where you may not have partial credit on your system. It may not be something working for you. So I'd like to tell folks that uh, it's possible you would get partial credit. It's not guaranteed that you would get partial credit. And one of the things that that you'll never know, by the way, looking at the results is that you never know whether you received any partial credit. There's no way to decipher that. So you just don't know. You never know how that's going to go. All right, back to our task manager real quick. I've brought up task manager here in my Windows uh, 11 desktop. It shows all the tasks that are running. Also shows background processes. I mentioned background processes earlier. That's because normally inside of your control panel in the administrative tools, there is a services applet for that. But you'll notice inside of Task Manager, not only are these tabs across the top for app history and startup programs and users and details, but there is a services tab inside of Task Manager. And that services tab lists all of the services configured on your system. Look how many services are there, just hundreds of services that are listed there. Everything from your Xbox services to your printing services to storage services, encryption and security services, everything that's running behind the scenes is in here. And you can, of course, choose any one of these and start it, stop it, or modify any of this from this front end. You can even open the services applet if you would like. So here's a sort of an inceptionist kind of 
view of the world, you got Task Manager with the Services tab, and then you have the Services app itself. So both of those completely valid uh, in this particular case, and I would accept for an answer either Services or Task Manager, or if you're really good, you chose both because that's really what it would be. Of course, this is for us to kind of get a feel for all of these working. But that's this is really a good example of how all of these different utilities can be used for different functions. And some of them can even be used for similar functions. Make sure you're familiar with that, especially as things have migrated through the years from Windows 7 to Windows 8 to Windows 10 and finally Windows 11. Of course, on your exam, all you really have to know about is Windows 10 and Windows 11. So if you have no knowledge of previous Windows versions, you may not even realize that there is services tab inside of task manager and that it used to be somewhere else so that's that's the real challenge if you ever work through these is being able to broke break through all of them so I'll, I'll accept either one for answer to disable a background process i will accept either services or task manager or both i think those are perfectly valid to be able to choose from let's now shift our gears by the way that was your performance-based question of the month Notice that it was a question, it was almost like four or five different questions in one, uh, which is very, very common in performance-based questions. Just another way to ask you information that you probably know already or certainly should know already based on the exam objectives. Let's now keep moving forward. I have a, uh, we're going to go back to our multiple choice-based questions. And this next question I have for you asks, a user is authenticating to a system using a username, password, and fingerprint. Which of the following would best describe this authentication? Would it be certificate-based, radius, 802.1x, multi-factor, or WPA3? All of these are real technologies. All of these have something to do with authentication. But we need to figure out which one of these best describes a user authenticating to a system using a username, password, and fingerprint. Is that certificate-based, radius, 802.1x, multi-factor, or WPA3? As always, please, no answers in the chat room, no hints in the chat room. We're going to answer using the link that is on your screen. Go to professormesser.com slash QA to lock in your answer. Uh, that is exactly what you might be looking for. Um, folks in the chat room are going, oh, is that where the, the print spooler is? It's inside the services? That's exactly where it is. After all, where's the, where do you see the spooling taking place? You don't actually see it. Uh, that's exactly the case you would find. So whenever you start going into and looking at these questions, Make sure you understand exactly what's happening behind the scenes in Windows and what utilities would be best to use for different utilities. Make sure you step through all of those. This is our question today about um, a user authenticating to a system using a username, password, and fingerprint. Which of the following would best describe this authentication? If you think you know the answer, go to professormaster.com slash QA and lock in your answer. See if you happen to know what this one is. All of these you should know. Uh, and then really that's the point with the answers that I like to do in the study group is every single one of these comes from the exam objectives so that you can at least get familiar with some of these things that maybe you aren't sure uh, when you're working through them. See how you do with all of this. Uh, let's now, we've got a number of people have locked in their answer. Let's see how you did. So the question Again, was a user is authenticating to a system using a username, password, and fingerprint. Which of the following would best describe this authentication? Is it certificate-based, radius, 802.1x, multi-factor, or WPA3? And if we look at how you answered the question, 96% of you say it's multi-factor. But we can see that we've got 3% that said radius, 1% that said certificate-based, and 1% that said 802.1x, 0% said WPA3. So really the question becomes, is this one that, uh, that you would absolutely be familiar with, that you would work through, or could it be one of these others? And in fact, at least one other answer could potentially be correct. Which one would you pick as your second 
best choice? What if multi-factor was not available? Which of the other four would be close enough that you could perhaps choose it? It wouldn't be a perfect match, but it would be close enough. First, let's look at the answer that I think everybody ended up getting on here. 96% of you chose multi-factor. So that is a very good example of using more than just one type of factor to authenticate to a system. Whenever you start getting into these, it becomes incredibly important that you're familiar with the authentication process and the way that people are using this authentication process. One of the things that I like to focus on is as I'm putting in the authentication, I'm thinking to myself, what type of factor is this? So you should think about this. Our question, for example, talked about a username, which is not an authentication factor because the username tends to be something publicly accessible to everyone. It's not something you tend to hide, and it's something that somebody, if they ask, what's your username, generally you can tell them that information. Now, if it's a stranger, of course, you just don't want to hand out your username to anyone. It gives them a little bit more information than they really need, but it's not something that's considered private. Of course, password is something that would be an authentication factor. It's something only you know, and it's something that's in your head. So that's the real key, is, is being able to really understand where the different options are when you're logging in and what you're doing with them. So putting in a password, that's something I know because it's in my brain. It's not something that you get from anywhere else, and it's nothing that anyone else would know because it's stored in the synapses or wherever we store things in the brain. This is why I'm a technologist and not someone in the medical field, by the way, if you haven't figured that one out already. So the other option we have here is a fingerprint. Fingerprints are also ways that we can associate a person with what they are doing. So a fingerprint, of course, is another type of factor. It's not something you know. It's something you happen to be, something you are. So that is a, a very good way to do authentication. That way we can at least have a pretty good chance if you know both the password and your fingerprint matches, we feel pretty good that that's going to be a valid authentication. So very common to be able to use these. And that means that these other options we chose from were not the best choices for this. So let's step through each of these other options and see if we can figure out how or why they were not the best choice. Let's start down here with WPA3, which got zero votes. That makes me so sad. Zero votes. No love for WPA3, but that's probably because most of you already realize WPA WPA2 and WPA3 are encryption mechanisms, uh, security mechanisms that are integrated into our 802.11 wireless networks. So WPA3, a perfect example of securing a wireless network, but that has nothing to do with using a username, password, or fingerprint to authenticate to a system. So not what we would choose. In fact, 0% of you thought, no, nah, that's not a good choice. That's not our best description of this authentication. We have certificate-based at 1%. Certificate-based means we are putting a certificate on this computer. It's kind of like a calling card. Oh, you're going to use a corporate machine, we're going to put a digitally signed certificate on that corporate machine so that whenever you log in, we check to see if that certificate is there, if it has been digitally signed by the company, and if it's valid, and if all of those things match, we'll consider that an authentication factor because you have your laptop with you or your mobile device. The certificate matches all of that. Therefore, that is effectively something you have. We also have 802.1x, which got 1%. 802.1x uh, is a standard for being able to authenticate over these systems. How do we get the username, password, and fingerprint information across the network? We can do that using 802.1x. Some people will refer to this as a network access control mechanism, but it's really an authentication mechanism. It's a very standard way for handling authentication. And if you log into a wireless network when you're at the office or you log into a printer, uh, it may be using 802.1x to verify your authentication. So once you type in all of your authentication credentials, 802.1x is going to allow you to check those credentials, usually against a centralized database. Well, that centralized database may be a standard as well. For example, there are centralized databases that use LDAP. They use Kerberos. There are some uh, databases that might use TACAX. But of course, one of the most popular is RADIUS. 
Radius is a very common way to check your authentication credentials against a centralized database. There are so many different devices that can communicate via Radius. And of course, there are many different Radius services that you can install on your network. It's very common to enable Radius inside of Active Directory or to have a standalone Radius server. There's lots of open source options available for that as well. But that does not describe the username, password, and fingerprint. It describes the checking of that username, password, and fingerprint. So that's what we're focusing on is being able to understand this username, password, and fingerprint. And as 96% of you chose, multi-factor, one of the best ways to make that happen. If you're using multiple factors to log in, it is indeed multi-factor. Let's uh, have a look at another multiple choice based question I have. This next one is during startup, a Windows computer shows the message, one or more services failed to start. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this message? Is it invalid startup device selected, an invalid VLAN assignment, a bootloader replaced or changed, incorrect service permissions, or an outdated UEFI BIOS? During startup, a Windows computer shows the message, one or more services failed to start. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this message? Is it an invalid startup device was selected, an invalid VLAN assignment, a bootloader was replaced or changed, an incorrect service permission was configured, or an outdated UEFI BIOS is installed. One of those is going to be the most likely reason for this message. And that, again, is one of the most important parts of this, is that we have to choose the most likely reason, even if it wasn't ultimately the reason, it has to be a better reason than anything else. That's a very common thing that we see on the CompTIA exams. If you think you know the answer, please no answers in the chat room. You want to use this link that's on your screen, go to professormesser.com slash QA and lock in your answer. Folks in the chat room are already saying, oh yeah, I get this all the time. <laughs> this would be this would be a good one to drill down. In fact, when we're done going through the question, Let's talk about how you might troubleshoot this problem and the steps you would go through to very quickly narrow down why we are seeing this happen. So that's that's the real key. Unfortunately, as they mentioned in the chat room, there is no message that says zero or fewer services failed to start. That's I think that's what that would be nice if Windows just every once in a while would tell you, hey, just wanted to let you know everything's running fine. <laughs> Windows has never said that. Uh, I guess we just guess. I guess Windows has to tell us if everything's okay. Uh, this is one where uh, you also, if you're looking at this message, it should lead you in a few different directions. But this question is asking you about the most likely reason. Um, and in fact, you may find that certain configurations or certain uh, options here, one of these options could indeed ultimately provide that message on the screen, but is not the most likely reason given the other options available. So this is another one where there are multiple options you could choose in this answer, but only one is the most likely reason. Now, when you see this on the exam, you will, you will find, and a lot of people will say, well, that's kind of tricky. That's a tricky question because uh, there's multiple choices. Technically, they would have multiple answers here to choose from, and they're asking me for the most likely. But when you get a question like that, the one that is most likely is so remarkably likely above, well above the others, that is obviously the answer. So that's what I'll tell people is they say, they often will say after an exam, there were trick questions on the exam. Say, oh, they weren't trick questions. You just didn't know the answers. So of course they look like a trick question. If you know your stuff, if you know the exam objectives, if you know all of these different topics, if you know what an invalid device uh, an invalid VLAN, a bootloader, a service permission, or an outdated UEFI BIOS is and how it affects the system, this will be a very obvious question to answer. There's no trick about it. It's very specific. It's pointing you in a direction. There should be, when you read a question like this and look at the answers, there should be arrows pointing to the right answer. There should be lights flashing. There should be neon arrows and lights telling you, there it is. There's the answer you should be choosing. It should be very, very 
uh, very, very obvious when you step through it. So let's see how obvious it was to you. The question again asked, during startup, a Windows computer shows the message one or more services failed to start. I think we've all seen this, by the way. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this message? Would it be invalid startup device selected, invalid VLAN assignment, bootloader replaced or changed, incorrect service permissions, or outdated UEFI BIOS? And let's see what you selected. If we have a look at the results, 42% of you, not quite a majority, but at least that's the plurality of you say it's an incorrect service permission. However, 28% say that you've changed your bootloader or maybe replaced the bootloader that's in your system. 20% of you say an invalid startup device was selected. 9% say there is an outdated UEFI BIOS. And 1% say it's invalid VLAN assignment. Well, this is the real challenge, of course, when you're starting your system. This is why we often tell people, if you've ever walked into a data center, and there's usually part of the data center that's relatively new and all of the fancier equipment sort of near the front, but the more you walk towards the back, you'll notice the equipment starts getting older and older and older, and eventually there will be a system in the back that has a not, not a yellow sticky, but an entire piece of paper taped to the monitor because there's always a monitor plugged into it. It's never on the KVM for some reason. It's an entire piece of paper so you can't see the screen. And that monitor, that the message on, the, on that piece of paper says, do not restart, do not power down. And I think we all know why that is because no one's powered this thing down in so long that nobody really feels that it's going to power back up again properly. And if it doesn't, there's nobody that works here anymore that understands what's running on that system. So instead of, instead of doing this the right way, which is we need to really understand why the system is not working properly or why we're getting an error during startup, or maybe we're more knowledgeable on the, the technology running on that system, instead of doing that, we instead just put a sign on it and say, you know what, just don't touch it. That'll be our solution in the meantime. Uh, eventually, we'll hire someone. It'll be the new guy, and we can tell the new guy to, to really focus on that one uh, and work through that. Everybody in every data center has one of these. If there's not a physical sign there, everybody nudges you and says, don't touch that. You can do anything to these. Don't touch that one. We're not sure how it works. We have no idea what it runs on. Uh, it, we're just sure, it, maybe it runs on evil. Maybe it runs on some type of technology. Maybe it runs on uh, snack cakes. We're just not sure how this system works. So just don't touch it. You're fine. So this is what you get when you start these systems up. You might get a message that starts up that says uh, there's a problem. There's an issue. For example, one or more services failed to start. Usually this is a problem with the service running itself. And as we've already had this conversation today, services are executables that are running behind the scenes. There's no user interface functionality to it. There's not much you can do to see what's, what that service happens to be doing. Uh, all we really can do is control it using either the services applet or, as we mentioned earlier, the newer, newest versions of Windows, you can use the Task Manager and use the Services tab, where you can maybe go into the Services tab. You'll see that it's not running, and you can right mouse click it and say, okay, start her back up again. Maybe it was just a temporary glitch. Maybe there was a dependency that wasn't loaded yet that isn't properly associated with the service. So now that everything's back up and running, let's see if that works. I will tell you that even though that should be your first option, try starting it manually doesn't usually work. If we're getting an error during startup, these applications are made quite well to check for dependencies. So it's usually something else associated with that. All of your services will run either as the default system service, but you may have a service that requires enhanced permissions. Uh, something like uh, either a uh, normal user permission or perhaps an administrative Admin, uh, uh, type of control over that system. What if, for example, and I've done this in previous positions working in cybersecurity, where I wanted a firewall to be integrated to Active Directory. 
So there needs to be this this sort of middleman software that talks to the firewall and talks to Active Directory and is able to grab Active Directory information and provide that to the firewall so that you can set rules in the firewall that says if you're in the accounting department, you can use this application. If you're in the IT department, you can communicate with this IP address. And we can do that just by using Windows groups instead or Active Directory groups instead of using an IP address or some other type of, of requirement. But to do that, you need to have access to read from the Active Directory database. And that means you need enhanced capabilities. So in your task manager, you're going to want to, dr to drill down into it and have a look at all of the different options. So for example, uh, this is one that you will, will have to do from inside the services option because there are properties inside of services. So for example, this is our services applet. These are all the different services that are running on our system. I'm just going to choose one of these and choose properties. And you'll notice there's a tab inside of there called log on. This log on by default will log on with the local system account, but there are certain accounts that you will want to configure manually, either accounts that are built into your system, like the network service, or you've got an administrative login or an, or an operator login, and you would put that login right here inside of the service. You would click OK, and then you can try starting it up again with the Start option inside of your services applet. So pretty pretty nice thing to do, pretty easy to do, and a good way to troubleshoot it. Uh, so check those account permissions to see if that might be the issue. We need to check service dependencies. That is also something that you can see inside of your services option. We'll go back into the properties of these. There was a dependencies tab right to the right. So you can see for this service to work, it depends on these two system, this particular service is our IPsec policy agent properties. It requires the TCP IP protocol driver to be installed and running. Well, that makes sense. And there's a base filtering engine that is used for that as well, where the remote procedure call option is. So both of those have to be running for this to work. And if one of those is not running and this starts up, you could get a message that says this one or more services failed to start. And that's because did not have the proper driver inside of it, did not have the proper permissions, and did not have the right dependencies inside of it. And or could be either one of those. Uh, check the system files. It's a Windows service. You may have to reinstall the service. And then, of course, uh, for an application service, maybe this is not something built into Windows, but something you installed yourself, like that integration with the firewall, uh, you need to reinstall that application. Maybe that'll solve the problems you're looking for. Those are the options that we were hoping to see. And of course, the incorrect service permissions, where we add our own permissions, our own account name is the one we were looking for here. 42% of you chose that option. That is the correct one that we have on our list. We've also got 27% uh, of you show the bootloader has been replaced or changed. If that's the case, maybe we've installed Linux onto the system. Maybe we've, we've installed a newer version of Windows and it overwrote our bootloader. The bootloader is the first one of the first things that's accessed when you turn your system on to determine where it's going to boot the operating system from. Sometimes it gives you a list of operating systems to choose from, and you would choose, do you want to run Windows? Do you want to run Linux? Press 1 or 2. That's your bootloader. Well, if your bootloader was replaced or changed, your system wouldn't get past the boot process, or you would be choosing a different operating system during boot. You would not be getting a message called one or more services failed to start because you were able to start them up. So that's not our issue. A bootloader happens well before Windows starts, so that's not what we would see with a bootloader problem. We also can see there's an option here for invalid startup device selected. Uh, we would normally select that in the BIOS of the system. And that's another situation where if we didn't have the right startup device selected, it would never start Windows. Therefore, you would never see this message. And that's why option A is not the correct one. We also have 9% that said an outdated UEFI BIOS. Don't commonly have to upgrade your BIOS unless there is a known problem with the BIOS. So this is not something we would commonly constantly update. Uh, but having a UEFI BIOS there is one that allows you to set where you're going to start up from uh, and other hardware settings. But if this wasn't right, if there was a problem with the BIOS, it would never get to the part where it was starting up Windows, and you would never see the message that one or more Windows 
one or more services failed to start. So that would not be the right answer either. The only answer that makes really any sense here is the incorrect service permissions. Now, if the incorrect service permissions wasn't there, there's a possibility that there may be a service that was expecting you to be connected to a certain VLAN, or it may require connectivity to a particular device that's not on the same VLAN as you. I guess technically, you could say that invalid VLAN assignment could be one of those reasons. But all of the other three that are left over after that are all problems that would occur during startup and would not be associated with this particular error. So here, by far, I mentioned that there would be neon signs and arrows pointing you to the right answer. This is a very good example of this is that there's only one here that makes any sense. And it is answer D, incorrect service permissions. That's what we were looking for. You chose D, incorrect service permissions. You got that one absolutely right. Well done. There, as you can see already, we've talked about Windows. We've talked about security. We've talked about uh, a lot of different topics already. And we're only scratching the surface. The core one and core two exams are extensive in how much information is inside of these certifications. In fact, if you look at both of my core one and core two courses, it's 137 videos total. That is that is a lot of information. Over 19 hours of training videos are inside of that. And although I, I really recommend you watch every single minute of every single video, there is a reality check. And I think most people are probably going to skip some that they're very familiar with, or maybe just don't have time to go through every single video that might be there. If that's the case, you may want to consider getting my course notes. I've already taken everything from my videos and put them into a set of notes that you can download immediately. They're in a PDF format. You can put them on all of your mobile devices, on your systems at home. And every video, all of the text, all of the important graphics, all of the charts, all of the important images and screenshots, they're all in these course notes. And I have them separated out video by video by video. So you can find exactly what you're looking for. And you can find anything that you might need inside of these notes because it's associated with the videos that you've already watched. Not only is there this digital version of the course notes, there are also physical versions. So if you prefer a printed book, we've got that for you as well. And if you purchase the printed book, I'm going to print it up and ship it to you. But I'm also going to give you the digital version for free so you can download it immediately and start learning today instead of waiting on the mail to show up. And eventually, after we print this and it spends a week or so uh, uh, being shipped around the country, then you'll be able to pull it out of the, your, your package and be able to use the physical version. If you live outside the United States, I ship worldwide. So it takes a little bit longer to get to you, but we'll absolutely ship it to you as well. Uh, folks at the chat room are saying, do I do book signings? I just, I can imagine myself at, at a book retailer at, at a table in the back, just sort of sitting there and hearing the crickets go. So I, I don't do book signings and I don't sign my books. Uh, the books are actually printed on demand uh, from a third party. So I just tell them, hey, uh, uh, we've got folks that want to get the book. Uh, Drew wants to get the book. So uh, send Drew the book. I never get my hands on it. I never physically touch it. I was going to say it's it's never physically touched by humans. That's not true. Uh, but I don't get to touch it before it gets gets to you, unfortunately. So I don't, I'm not able to sign these. If you want to know more about the, uh, the, the view of these course notes and so many other training materials we have on our site, you can find it at professormesser.com slash 1102 notes. Let's do some more questions. I've got another one here. This question asks, a system administrator creates separate backup rotations every hour, every day, and every week. Which of the following would best describe this system? Is that incremental, TAR, GFS, synthetic, or RAID? A system administrator creates separate backup rotations every hour, every day, and every week. Which of the following would best describe this system? Is that incremental, TAR, GFS, synthetic, or RAID? If you think you know the answer, go to professormesser.com slash QA. That's right there on your screen. Lock in your answer. Please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. You want to lock in your answer following that link, professormesser.com slash QA. This would be a great place to go to lock in what you might be looking for. 
I think some of you might know this one already. I tend to watch the numbers increment. And I think if it's an easier question, they tend to increment faster. If it's a harder question, they increment slowly. Or if it's a question that we've all gotten wrong, it goes pretty quick. So that's another good way to have a look at the different options available. Uh, backups are certainly part of the exam. There's an entire video on backups. And, and for good reason, what's your backup look like? That's what the commercial should say. Um, and that's one that if you don't have a backup of your system, you should today start thinking about ways to get a backup of this system. Maybe you start very simply by connecting your system to a cloud-based file storage system, something secure, where you can take files that you're storing locally and have those automatically copied back into the cloud. But then you also want to think about other ways to have backups of these. Do you have an external storage drive? Do you have a NAS at home? Do you have some other large storage that you could use to back up your critical files and information? You should start thinking about that today and come up with a way to automate it so that you're not going to be responsible for doing it. It just happens automatically. I have mine happen in the middle of the night. Once I leave the studio, I go to sleep. And during the sleepy time, it's doing all kinds of backups and transferring data and moving things around so that no matter what happens with my website, no matter what happens with my local devices, I've got another backup in another location that I can pull those from. So that's important, too. And as they're saying in the chat room, an important consideration, make sure you have multiple backups here because, as people have even said, I've backed up onto external drives, and then the drive would fail. And now you don't have a backup anymore. So always have multiples. We do talk about this in our video as well at having a, a 3 to one kind of backup scenario, which is a real backup scenario. Make sure you're familiar with those. Already in the chat room, they're going, yeah, 3 to one That's what you need. So you're absolutely correct. Let's see how you did with this one, which asks, a system administrator creates separate backup rotations every hour, every day, and every week. Which of the following would best describe this system? Is it incremental, tar, GFS, synthetic, or RAID? And what did you choose? We are all over the place with this one. 66% of you, though, say that is incremental is what we have done. 21% uh, said GFS. 11% said RAID. And then we've got 1% said TAR and 1% that said synthetic. This is one of those examples. Why did I even say it? I may have, I may have taken the entire chat room and hexed you. Uh, it may have not been a good thing to mention that I often say that if the number goes up quickly, it could be that we're all choosing the wrong answer. And guess what happened? We all chose the wrong answer. 66% of you chose the wrong answer. It is not incremental, which means that the answer, as we look at it and what it might be, has to be something a little bit better than that. In fact, it is grandfather, father, and son. So that's, that is where we would set up three separate backup rotations. GFS is three separate ones. A good example of those would be something like monthly, weekly, and daily. Or in our case of our question, it's daily, weekly, or hourly, daily, and weekly, which are perfectly legitimate GFS rotations. The idea being that we would have multiple rotations of backups taken at different times. So you might have one done once a month, we're going to do a backup of our system. We'll call that our grandfather backup. And then once a week, we're going to do a backup also of everything. And we're going to call that our father backup. And then every day, we will also do a backup. That might be our son. And we could do even all of these might be full backups, in fact. We might do a full backup every month. We might do a full backup every week. And we might do a full backup every day if we wanted to. If we got the drive space, you got the, the tapes or the storage that you want to put them on, those would be completely legitimate ways to do it. And it might look something like this. There's your calendar with all of the different backups. You can see there is a sun backup every weekday. We could, of course, extend that into the weekends if we wanted to. There's a father backup every week. This one happens to be on Monday. You can put it whenever you would like. And then we've got a, a finally a monthly backup that we're going to call our grandfather. And you could, of course, extend this. What if you want to do six-month backups? What if you want to do quarterly backups? You could put those into the mix and just extend out your family tree for it to be as, as large as you would like it to be. There's, of course, costs and time associated with the backup process. So this is not something you can do willy-nilly, but it does help you with what you're looking for. You just choose the rotation you would like to have there and set it up, and away 
it will go with all of those on the GFS format, which is grandfather, father, and son. So that's that's the way it would work. Hey, since it's Good Friday tomorrow, there we go. We got got the link in there. I, got, I don't know how that worked. Uh, this is the right answer. Answer C is what we were looking for, where you have GFS, and 21% of you chose GFS, which really moves us back to the very first answer of incremental, because 65% of us said incremental is what we would choose. Incremental is a style of backup. You might do a full backup. You might do an incremental backup. You might do a uh, a backup that is synthetic. Uh, there's a lot of different types of backups and methods for doing this. But in this case, I didn't say what we were backing up. I didn't say how we were performing the backup or what specific data we were backing up. I instead said, we're just doing this at certain times of the day or certain times of the week or certain times uh, uh, every hour, every day, and every week. I didn't say what we did during that hour, what we did every day or what we did every week. They could all be full backups every hour, a full backup every day and a full backup every week. So that's not incremental. That's a full backup. Could be a snapshot every hour, a snapshot every day, and a snapshot every week, which technically, that, that one's kind of incremental. But I didn't say it was a snapshot, and I didn't say it was incremental. I just said we're taking a backup. So it would not be incremental based on the description we have here. In fact, it could be a full backup. But that's to be fair, that's the reason I put incremental as the first option here to see who I could hook. I hooked a lot of folks on this one. 65% of you chose that one, but not the correct answer. Nothing about this question implies what we were backing up. It just says that we're creating separate backups. So make sure you're familiar with that as we go through. Um, RAID, the redundant array of inexpensive or independent disks, depending on how old you are, uh, is 12% of the responses. RAID is a method for maintaining uptime and availability of data that is stored on storage drives. RAID is not backup. So the, I'm glad that I have that option there. I wasn't even thinking about it when I did the question. 12% of you chose RAID because we were talking about backup. If there's a conversation going on about backup, RAID is never the answer because RAID is not backup. RAID has never been backup. RAID will never be backup in its current form anyway. I guess there's a way we could make it backup, but it's not. That's not what RAID is and not why we have RAID. RAID is not a way to backup any data. If anything... Raid, RAID perhaps is worse than a backup, <laughs> uh, worse than not having a backup in that particular case because people think they are protected when they have RAID. We put in RAID 5. We've got plenty of storage. We, we're going to consider that our backup. And then immediately your manager comes to you and says, oh, I deleted, the, or I deleted everything in my spreadsheet and I just saved it. Could you give me this, the previous version, please? Thanks. Oh, I don't have a previous version. We have RAID. Uh, and we have we have a good copy of your empty spreadsheet. Would you like a good copy of your empty spreadsheet? No, I would like a backup of my spreadsheet, maybe from yesterday. Oh, we don't do backups. We have RAID. RAID's better than backups. This is a good example of that, isn't it? It's worse than backups. So that's why RAID is not a backup method. Uh, it, has, it does nothing for you for backups. You should have a backup of your RAID array in fact, so that you can pull the spreadsheet from yesterday and replace that in your RAID array so that people can now have access to the data that they deleted and then saved to your RAID array. That's kind of the problem with RAID, isn't it? Uh, synthetic backup, a uh, synthetic full backup, or a synthetic backup in general, is a backup you created based on previous backups. So if you don't have time to create a full backup, you can take a full backup and all the incrementals up to that point to create effectively a new full backup without ever having to touch the original system. You could just create that full backup based on your backup media, which is an interesting way to do it and a very fast way to do it too. But it has nothing to do with having rotations every hour, every day, and every week. And only 1% of you chose that one, so you knew that pretty well. And then lastly, TAR the tape archive utility, a Linux utility, is one that is commonly used to backup files on a Linux system. I use TAR all the time on my Linux system to do backups and move data around. 
but it is not a way to set up rotations every hour, every day, and every week. It may be ultimately once we set up the rotations, we might use TAR to perform whatever backup system we chose, whether it's a differential, an incremental, a synthetic, a, well, we wouldn't do, I guess TAR could be used with synthetic offline, and then we have full backups we can use TAR as well. But that's the idea, is to have um, to have some method to back up the data. We weren't asking about the method. We were asking about the time frames and the multiple rotations in place. And the, the one that would best describe this in these five options is indeed GFS, your grandfather, father, and son backups. That was answer C, and 21% of you got that one absolutely right. If you're watching this video for continuing education unit credit or CEU credit, which means you already have your A plus or your network plus or security plus or some other certification, and you need to maintain that certification so that you can upgrade or maintain a, a renewal of that certification later, then you want to follow these instructions to earn a one-hour webinar category CEU. What you would do is go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website. There's a Contact Us link on that page. Uh, when you click the Contact Us, it brings up a form where you would put your name, put your email address. In the subject line, put April 2023. And in the body of the message, put the super secret code word of the month, Grandfather, Father, Son. And if you want to abbreviate it as GFS, I'm fine with that too. That is your super secret code word of the month. Put that on a line by itself in the body of the message. And then if you'd like to put anything else in the message underneath that, you're more than welcome to. I do read through every single one of these. I get hundreds of these a month, so I'm not able to respond back to every single one of these. But I do read through every single one of these before I send out these CEU notifications. And uh, it takes me about a week, and then I send back to you an email that has a digitally signed message that says, here is your certification for one hour of a webinar category CEU. You must have been here for this video because you knew the super secret code word, GFS or grandfather, father, son. Uh, that's one that can very easily get you a, a an email that is useful if you are audited for your CEUs or if you're using CEUs to, to gather your your renewal process. Not everybody uses CEUs, I realize. So if you are someone who is using CEUs for this or something else, I'll be glad to send you that email. That's absolutely something you might want to use. Well, I've got, I've got more here. I know we're at the top of the hour, but I have another question that I want to do. We'll do a little, I know we're even well past the top of the hour, but let's do some overtime right now with a question I have on here. This question is one that comes from uh, not a, not necessarily a new question, maybe new to you, because this comes from my practice exams book. For those of you that have looked around the internet for practice exams, this is a challenge. Uh, they're now even starting to make practice exams that humans aren't even writing. Guess the quality of those when you start breaking them down. They're not very good. Uh, it's so good that people who are making these are saying these may not be so good. So let me know if one's not good and maybe I'll delete it. That's that's how great those questions are. Or you go to a website and the questions are just wrong completely and poorly written and have nothing to do with the exam objectives. That can be frustrating. And so what I wanted to do was create a series of practice exams that were specifically written in the style and tone that CompTIA uses on their exams. I also wanted to be sure that everything in these books had exactly the current exam objectives associated with them. There are no outdated questions in this book. There's no options for things that aren't listed in the exam objectives because CompTIA is not going to do that on their exam either. Uh, this is a set of questions I wrote, not a, not a machine, not some third party who has nothing to do with CompTIA. These I wrote from the very beginning to the very end. And this is my practice exams book. There are three separate practice exams inside of this, all with multiple choice and performance-based questions inside of it. Let's do a question from the book. You'll get a feel for how this works. This is uh, practice exam B on my 1102 book. Uh, this question asks, a technician is delivering a new laptop to a user and moving the older laptop to a different user. Which of the following would allow the existing hard drive to be used but prevent recovery of any of the previous user's data? Is it a regular format? Do we run a defragmentation? Do we connect the laptop to the Windows domain? Or do we delete the user's folder? 
that, that backslash users folder is what we're referring to. Uh, and you can see in this book, those four options are available. Now, this is a PDF, so if you wanted to annotate, you can always go into this and choose an option or highlight different parts of the screen. Or if you use it with a stylus, you can draw things on the screen as well. You've got options for that. But also because it is a PDF, you can click on the section that says Quick Answer, which just tells you whether it's A, B, C, or D. Or you can click this option that says The Details, which moves you up to page 171, which I'm not. I'm on page 142 right now. So we'll go to The Details. I'll click that, and it speeds me through the rest of the book directly to the answer page, which tells me that the answer is A, regular format. And of course, I explained to you why that's the right answer. This is something that can be very useful. Uh, when you're working on a system, uh, working with your questions to know if you got the question right. But I always get the question wrong. And very often, these questions you'll find scattered around the internet always tell you why the right answer is right, but they very, very rarely, if ever, tell you why the wrong answer is wrong. And I think there's an opportunity to learn there. So I've taken every incorrect answer, and I've explained why answer B, run a defrag defragmentation, is not the right answer. I've explained why C, copy the laptop or connect the laptop to the Windows domain, why that's not the right answer. And then D, delete the users folder, why that's not the right answer. So that's where you would go to is a regular format. And by the way, there's people in the chat room going, regular format, it only overwrites every sector with zeros and ones, or really with zeros. Uh, all you have to do is overwrite at one time. You're never recovering that data. I know the, the internet and videos on the YouTube, they will tell you that you need some third-party utility and you have to run multiple passes over the drive. You don't. Just overwrite it one time, it's gone forever. And if you can find me an example of somebody recovering a hard drive after performing a regular format, I'll be glad to revisit the, the issue. You will find, however, there is not a case of that. No one has ever recovered a hard drive after formatting it with a regular format because there's nothing to recover. There's nothing there. So that's why to be able to do that. Uh, and if you're reading the question and you're thinking, I don't even understand what they're asking, at the very bottom of this list is a QR code and a link to the videos that are on my site so that you can watch the video where they had more information about the question itself. All of this is integrated into the PDF. These are my practice exams. I have some available for Core 1 and Core 2. And of course, not only are the PDF versions available, if you wanted a physical book, it's a big book, but uh, everything is there, 380 pages for the 220-1102 exam. And you can, of course, purchase them with the course notes and get a little bit of a uh, financial benefit. There's a little bit of a discount built into that. So you've got three separate exams in this one single book. And it's really more than three exams, really. When you start explaining every single answer, it's almost like you get more than a single exam out of it. And I think that's what we're trying to do. There should be this feedback loop that I got a question wrong. Why did I get a question wrong? And I've got to tell you, if you're working on this, and let's say you got it right. Let's say you chose regular format. The, the technologist in you and the person, the speed demon in you may say, next question, please. I got that one right. Next question. But I highly recommend you go through the incorrect answers and read through them because the question you might get on your exam might have something to do with deleting the backslash users folder or running a defragmentation or connecting the laptop to a Windows domain. And this gives you a little more feedback on this, gives you a little more perspective as to why one is right or one is wrong. That's the real key. And it's a PDF. So you can use this anywhere. You don't have to be connected to the internet. There's no engine that has to run. It doesn't know, it doesn't care if you're on Windows or Mac or Linux. It simply works all the time for everybody. And that's by design. Find out more on my website, professormesser.com slash core2pe. Well, we've gone through an entire hour of Q&A at this point. And when you start breaking things down, you'll notice that everything we looked at today came directly from the CompT exam objectives. That's because the objectives are really your best choice 
for understanding exactly what's on this exam. Let me go back to a, to a view of these exam objectives so we can really break it down and see it. You can see that just for Section 1 operating systems, identify basic features of Microsoft Windows editions, Windows 10 editions, like Home, Pro, Pro for Workstations, and Enterprise, or feature differences like domain access versus workgroup, desktop style slash user interface, availability of remote desktop protocol, and so on. That's why I say if you know every bullet from the exam objectives, because we're just going to scroll through pages of these objectives so you can see just how many bullets we're talking about, there are hundreds of exam objectives on here. So that's what we're working on and being able to, to break those down. I think that's really what you want to be able to do. That's the real important part of understanding the details of this is that it is enormous. And so make sure you use these. These are great checklists. They are free from CompTIA. Make sure you have a look at it. Go to professormesser.com slash objectives, and you'll be able to break that down. It's very useful. Hopefully, that's something you can work on, too. I think uh, uh, as you start looking at the different uh, scope of these exams and the the large number of objectives, you really start understanding when you might be ready to take this exam and even better, when you may not be ready to take this exam. The objectives can tell you. There's a link over to CompTIA to grab these objectives if you go to professormesser.com slash objectives or simply type into your favorite search engine, CompTIA exam objectives. It'll take you right to them. Those are the things that you want to get. And again, absolutely free. We do one of these study groups every month. I do A-plus study groups, usually in the first couple of weeks of the month. You can see that we have the Core 1 study group scheduled for May the 2nd and May the 4th for the Core 2. Also, I have Network Plus study group next week on Thursday. You can come back for that here in April. And I've got one scheduled on May 10th for next month. And then we've got a Security Plus study group also for April. And you can see the Security Plus study group scheduled for May 17th. There's always something interesting going on. If you want to know when the next study group happens to be, go to professormesser.com slash calendar, and you'll be able to Break that down exactly. You'll know when and where we are doing these study groups. Well, that is an hour of Q&A already. We've got plenty to talk about in the after show. So stick around for that, where instead of me asking you questions, you get to ask me questions. So we always have some interesting questions come up in the after show. Stick around immediately after this. Just stay tuned right after this. We've also got our practice exams and course notes on our website. You can check those out at professormesser.com. And don't forget about the discounted vouchers at professormesser.com slash vouchers. If you liked this video, we would love it if you gave it a thumbs up. You could do that right in the the viewer that you're using right now. Or if you're on the YouTube website, you can do it. And we'd love for you to subscribe to our channel as well. All of this helps. And if you're someone who wants to support what we're doing here, that is a fantastic way to help support that. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. Thanks for being here in this first hour. We appreciate your support and your answers to these questions. It's always a lot of fun. Stick around for the after show. We'll see you in just a couple of seconds. Thanks again. And Thanks for joining us on today's Core 2 A Plus study group. Thanks, everybody. Now, let's get, let's get a drink of whatever this is. And let's now do an after show, everybody. The formal me asking you question part of the show is now over. But now, perhaps in many ways, even better questions come in to our after show. We can kind of see all of these as we're breaking through those. Uh, I don't even know where some of these questions come from. Let's Play always has a, a, a great deal of, of interesting, well-thought-out questions. Do I drink wine every day? <laughs> no, I don't drink wine every day. I, I haven't actually had uh, an alcoholic beverage in, in I, don't, I couldn't say any alcoholic beverage. I've had a sip of one or two through the years. I don't tend to drink though, so they just it just takes a it, it takes too much away from what I'm doing. I can't wake up in the morning and really get going. I wake up early and I get in here and I start writing content. That's difficult to do uh, with a uh, uh, scotch. <laughs> it's really hard to do with scotch, so I just don't, uh, and it works out just fine. So no, no wine for me. Thank you so much. Let's now focus on some questions we have coming in regarding 
uh, certifications, exams, technology, and other things in general. Although you're welcome to ask anything you would like. If you would like to ask a question, I'm looking at the chat that's coming up. The chat room, as it's going by, is available on YouTube. It's the YouTube chat. If you're on my website at professormesser.com slash live, there is also a chat on that screen. It's the same chat. So you don't have to jump back and forth to anything. Just use the embedded chat on my site or use the chat that's included on the YouTube site. It's exactly what we would be able to use there. So let's ask some questions uh, or answer some questions we have. Uh, this is one that's kind of a confusing question when you first look at it. So I'll break this down for you. Uh, this question comes from, uh, from Chris. This question asks, is the 1101 and 1102 still called the Core 1 and Core 2? Because the 1001 and 1002 exams that are, are now retired were also called Core 1 and Core 2. Well, that's what their name is. Whether it is, regardless of the version of the questions they're asking you, that first exam is the Core 1, regardless of the version. The second exam is the Core 2, regardless of the version. So that's why with 1101 and 1102, it's still Core 1 and Core 2. Um, it, is, it is slightly confusing when you're expecting it to be something different, though. You would think uh, 1001 and 1002 were Core 1 and Core 2. How can the new one also be Core 1 and Core 2? Because it is. That's just what they call it. That's why in everything you see from me, in all of my training materials, in all of my books, in all of my videos, I put the version of the exam on those documents, on the video. It's on the front page. It's on the first video, or it's part of the index that is associated with that video. It's in the title of the video on YouTube, for example. That way, you can look at the title and know immediately, oh, this is for the 1101. Oh, this is for the 1102. If it's for any other exam and any other version, it doesn't currently apply. So I will still use both of these, the 220-1101, the 220-1102, Core 1 and Core 2, just so you know what I'm really talking about. I'm very specific so that you know you're watching the right training material. So don't worry so much that it's Core 1, Core 2. It, apparently, it's just going to always be Core 1 and Core 2. So I don't know. There's, there's ways to do that. Hey, I was in this study group, and it said there were 11 questions, and we didn't go through 11 questions. What's up with that, says Gabriel? Uh, it's, it's about time. It's about uh, uh, being able to do everything in a single hour, unfortunately. I write a bunch of questions so that I'm able to get through at least one hour of Q&A, and anything we don't go through is ready for next week, and then I build some more out. So that, that way, what if we were in a mood and we wanted to go through another five minutes of questions or wanted to do a couple of extra for some reason? Maybe we had some technical problems and I wanted to extend a little bit. I have that option. Uh, but generally, it's one hour for that first section of the study group and then one hour for the after show um, and being able to work through those. This is a good question because we talked about the practice exams books that I have. Uh, Skylar says, will I ever make my practice exams in a digital form so they can get graded automatically? So, there, of course, let's, let's break this out. They're already in a digital form. They're already available in PDF format. You can use that PDF format offline. You can read it on any device in the world offline. You can annotate the PDF. You can draw on it. You can do anything with that PDF you would like. It's not locked. It's not... There's no prohibited functions in the PDF. It's not somehow inaccessible in certain ways. There's no licensing you have to do. It's just a PDF, and it works everywhere. That's by design. If you get into uh, formats for practice exams that have to be, they have to be online on somebody's website, or they have to run only in Windows, or only in Mac OS, or only in iOS, or only in Android, or you have to write four different engines, one for Windows, one for Mac OS, one for Linux, one for iOS, one for Android, then it becomes a little bit overwhelming. So we have specifically created these questions to be in a format is a PDF so that they are available to everyone. And that's the real goal. If I had to create separate engines every time I want to do a practice exam, I'd be spending more time managing the engines than actually writing the content. And I realize some people would like a, a, an engine and they would like to be able to have some of the functions available in that engine. I absolutely understand. 
but I had to weigh that against the idea of making the information accessible to everyone and in a format that everyone would be able to, to have access to. So that's why it's in PDF format, and I don't have any plans currently to put it in any other type of format. Uh, other questions that are coming through, let's do another one. Um, the, some folks in the chat room were asking about a CompTIA continuing education unit credit. Yes, we did offer one today. You'll have to, uh, once this is over, rewatch to be able to get those. So that's that's where that came from. We do have CEUs that we try to do every month with these just so you can, can have that happen. So um, this is a pretty good one because it, it is a question that applies to A plus network plus and security plus and really IT in general which is, so if you see an app or an operating system that needs to be updated, you have to follow the change management process before updating those. The work environment's now at home, so how does that work? Well, it doesn't change. Change management is the same regardless of where you or the equipment happens to be located. And before Windows is updated, before patches are installed, before application updates are added to your system, someone has to test those to make sure that it doesn't break anything. There are plenty of examples that you can Google where Microsoft has released an update that completely ruins something in the operating system or an application that runs in the operating system. It disables it. It causes a fault. It causes that application not to work any longer. And in some cases, very rare cases, Windows itself stops working. So this is not something that for at home, maybe that's not a big deal. If Windows stops working, we'll roll back to a previous config or we'll simply reinstall Windows because it's your home computer. But when it's a company computer or an organization's computer, the goal is to make sure that you have as much time available to use that tool, because that's what a, a laptop, a tablet, a desktop computer, that's what these operating systems are. It's a tool to allow us to do our jobs. We need to make sure your tools are available to you. So we are going to do change management, even if it's on a laptop that you're using at home. Trust me, your IT department has agents running on that system you have at home that are able to monitor all of the software, all of the hardware, and report back the system and what it happens to be on. And they have ways to push down those changes to your laptop at home. So that's why it's uh, change management still incredibly important. Change management doesn't change if we happen to have our laptop at home versus our laptop at work. Change management is incredibly important. And that's why we talk about it in A+, Network+, and Security+, Plus all the time. Uh, an incredibly important part. That's a, that's a real goal and making sure that's, that's the key. Uh, let's have a look at other questions that are coming in. I'm going to keep going through. And uh, um, this is this is the one. This is uh, I'm not even sure what the answer to this one is, and it's and it's me. The question from Drew asks, "What's the company you worked for that you said had such an extensive security scanning process that they discovered multiple new malware apps?" Um, there, this actually would apply to two of the companies I have worked with in the past. I worked as a systems engineer for, at the time, the name of the company was Network Associates. That was a merger between Network General and McAfee Associates. They got rid of the McAfee name. They used the McAfee name on products when it was merged together, but the company was Network Associates. Well, obviously, McAfee is receiving uh, virus feeds from all of their customers and very often finding malware inside of their own labs. They, had, they have, as much as we like to complain about our antivirus companies, I got to see it on the inside. These are people uh, that are very well-trained in engineers. They know everything there is to know about finding malware and how they work. They are coming up with new innovative ways to find the malware and, and block it on a system before it causes problems. It's an ongoing battle because as soon as you find a way to block it or or identify it, the malware authors find ways around that. So it's a constant cat and mouse to try to keep up with the malware authors. Uh, so of course, McAfee did a great job at doing that. Then I moved to a company called Palo Alto Networks, a uh, company that at the time was coming out with this emerging technology to have the same type of powerful antivirus engine in a firewall. Imagine being able to, to look for a million different viruses 
all across the network in real time as the packets are flowing in, even though the firewall is only looking at a packet at a time or in the case of Palo Alto Networks, a number of packets at a time. There's not a lot of space on a firewall to collect an entire executable, then scan it on the firewall itself. That's why you'll start to see, and you have seen in the past, these firewalls that can do cloud-based malware detection where they will collect the file, but instead of the firewall looking at it, they send that file to the cloud where it's put into a virtual system. They run the executable. It identifies if there's malware on that system and then tells the firewall if anybody else Else downloads this, allow it. Or if anybody else downloads this, don't allow it if it has actually malware inside of it. And of course, gives you the alert that this person just downloaded a file that we believe has malware inside of it because we ran some tests and now we know. This is the challenge, of course, is to keep going faster and faster with the detection process. And that's uh, that is something that has in the last 10 years dramatically changed. There are new technologies for looking for malware and new technology technologies for stopping malware. One of the most interesting ones most recently is anti-malware technology that doesn't look at the signature of the malware, but instead looks at how the executable malware is affecting your system. So if you happen to have an executable running on your system and suddenly, let's take something simple, it changes the host file on your system then we know immediately that's malware because there should not be an executable changing the host file on your system. Uh, there are much more detailed and intricate descriptions of what it's looking for within the memory and operating system of your computer. But that's a very good example of how we can start moving away from signatures and move instead into ways to identify the results of the malware and block it on your system. Uh, constant, constant process to be able to do that. Um, the, uh, the firewalls that we work with today are exceptionally good at doing this. And it, and although it doesn't replace the malware, the anti-malware software that you're running on your in stations, it is another layer that we can add to, uh, be able to identify malicious code that may be coming through our systems. So, uh, you need everything you can in your tool belt. And that's another good one to have in your tool belt. They can stop things very quickly because we can stop it. We can look for it, identify it, and stop it in real time at multi-gigabit speeds on these latest versions of firewalls, which, by the way, is just remarkable. Um, it's incredible technology and what what they were able to put put the put into these brand new devices. And that's that's part of the fun that we did uh, for. For Palo Alto Networks, that was great because nobody had seen anything like that in the industry before. It was groundbreaking, It was, and it still continues to be groundbreaking and innovative. And I got to be a systems engineer showing people this brand new technology that, that imagine being a technologist, and we sort of get this with people who are not technologists, but imagine sitting in front of security professionals and telling them about this and then telling you that doesn't exist. There's no way you can do that. And oh, hold my beer, we'll plug in, and let me show you how this works. I know it's ironic because I don't drink any beer. But that's that's the idea is we were able to plug in the firewall. Here's how it does it. Let's do it right now. Let me show you how it works. And it did work. Um, that's, that's the other thing, by the way, I will tell you, if you get into this industry and you begin working for a manufacturer or a company that creates this technology, I, I did that the last 20 years of my career working for these companies, and it was always so remarkable and much a much better job when the product actually does what they say it does. <laughs> now, I know I, I'm kind of laughing to myself because if they tell you it does it, shouldn't it do that? Well, it should. Not all manufacturers and developers uh, will be completely transparent when it comes to the capabilities of their products. And in fact, they things may be written down that in fact the product doesn't actually do. This happens unfortunately all too often. If that happens to you, that should be a red flag because I'm here to tell you there are places to work where the technology they're putting together is being made by people who are very, very knowledgeable in the field Palo Alto Networks was a perfect example of this, that when you presented this technology to someone, not only does it do what they say it does, it actually does more than that. And that's where you want to work. So if you get into that part of the, the IT field, 
just take that little bit of advice, put it in your pocket. You may be able to use that later. Um, some other folks in the chat room are talking about other things. Um, for example, Jeremy says, it would be cool to have TikTok-like short format videos for learning. I think TikTok-like is the operative word here. What you really mean to say is YouTube short like, uh, by the way, you should never have TikTok on any of your mobile devices, not because it's poisoning the minds of the children, which for some reason, that's what this whole thing that we're now going through with TikTok has turned into. It's because that application is incredibly invasive. I highly recommend you read through some of the things that TikTok does. And if you think TikTok's not a problem, I would like you to take everything that you have captured into your clipboard and please send it to me. And if you think that's a problem, then you probably shouldn't use TikTok. And that's just one of many problems. It's an awful application that has uh, that is very, very invasive and very much of a concern to anyone who deals with privacy. Forget sort of the 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 larger geographic scope of this, and certainly the political scope of this, just from a personal privacy perspective, very bad application to use. But short format videos, they certainly have their place. But I kind of, in my world, the short format video is about five to 10 minutes. So I think we're going to stick with that on our YouTube channel. I think when they get too short, they often turn into not enough information. You start, because I've tried to put some of these together. Because I see the shorts on YouTube. I like the shorts on YouTube. I think they're a great idea. But for the type of certification training we're doing, there is not a lot of room for nuance. You really need to explain very specifically a lot of these technologies. Imagine doing subnetting on a YouTube short. 60 seconds of subnetting doesn't even make sense. Why would you why would you do that? Just watch the videos that are there. I think you'll you'll do fine. Um uh speaking of of people monitoring your clipboard, uh is does the course have subtitles? This one asks for traditional Chinese, but I get questions all the time uh, of subtitles in other languages. Uh, we don't currently offer uh, subtitles in any other language but uh, American English currently, but we have looked at that. And I think there's there's a place to be able to have that functionality, and I think there's a, there's a good reason to have those. But currently, we don't have a lot. This, this may be a chicken and egg problem. I don't have a lot of people in China wanting to watch the videos. Therefore, or people who speak Chinese wanting to watch the videos because they could be somewhere else. I could be in the U.S., um, but I don't have Chinese subtitles. But if I had Chinese subtitles, would they watch the videos? So there's there's the business challenge for all of us to work through. And that's currently, if I had to choose my first set of foreign languages, it would probably be Spanish. It might be French, maybe both of those. Those are my top two. And then the we sort of fill it in from there. But uh, th that is a that is a a process that is not it's very relatively easy to implement youtube allows you to do this i can embed these within the videos with no problem the offline version of the videos no problem embedding any type of subtitle the problem is the cost associated with creating subtitles and then doing quality assurance on that i don't speak french i don't speak spanish i don't speak chinese so it's hard for me to know if i receive a translation is that a good translation and then then there's more business problems associated with that. So currently, no, but, you know, eventually uh, we'll we'll get to a point where maybe other languages can be added to our study groups. But right now, uh, not the case. I just don't have any available now. Hey, I, do, I, do I do the same thing for Security Plus? I sure do. You can find a study group every month. There are um, archives available on the Professor Messer website and on my YouTube playlists. And you can find uh, the study group for Security Plus is two weeks from yesterday. So in a couple of weeks, we'll do Security Plus. Next week, Thursday, we do Network Plus. So I like to do these live streams. I like to do at least one a week. Um, sometimes we skip at the end of the month, but uh, you'll know exactly when the next one is by looking at our calendar at professormesser.com slash calendar. Um, here's a good one. This is a question that may not have the answer you think it is. Uh, Dev Parquet says, uh, I sometimes, I love that, by the way, I sometimes get confused on how much minimum hard drive storage is required for Windows Home or Pro version 8, version 10, version 11. I've gotten different answers when looking it up. 
the reason you've gotten different answers when you've looked up the minimum hard drive storage requirements is that they changed. Microsoft changed the minimum hard drive storage requirements for Windows 8, Windows 10, and Windows 11. So the reason uh, really is 10 and 11. I don't think they changed 8. Uh, but for 10 and 11, they absolutely changed them. You know, they start off, I think, at 16 megabytes, and now they increased it to 32. Am I thinking the wrong amounts? I could be. Uh, but they did increase the size. I think it's from 20 to 32 or 20 to 30, something like that. Uh, and, uh, of course, we made videos on these standards you know, whenever we created those those 1001, 1002 videos, we released them, everybody accessed them, and then Microsoft changed the number. Well, I can't change the videos. There's no way to go backwards in time. Uh, and now I can create new videos and post those if I wanted to. But um, since then, we've sort of updated our courseware. I give you links in the video of where this information came from. So if you wanted to confirm that with Microsoft, you can see that. And I think because of that, it would be very unlikely for you to get a question on an exam that says, what is the minimum hard drive storage required for Windows Pro 11 or Windows Pro 10? 10 would probably be a better example. Um, and, and then... They, just, they put both of them on there. Is it 20 or is it 32? So they're not going to do that because both of those are technically correct depending on which version of Windows you happen to be installing. Um, so that's why don't worry about those numbers. They're, they're there as a, a sort of a, a guideline to you, uh, but it's one of those that uh, even in the chat room, people are going, oh, it's 16. No, it's 30. No, it's we're even doing it there. That's because both of you are correct. It's both of those, depending on the addition of or the version of Windows 10 that you happen to be installing, not the addition, the version. Pretty important. And it's and people are even saying, no, it's 16 for 32 bit, it's 20 for 64. It is and it isn't. So there is no single answer on this one. There are multiple answers, and it's dependent on the version of Windows you happen to be installing. That's the right answer. So if they give that as an answer, that would be the right answer. It would just not be. Uh, in the middle of all of those things. I haven't received any emails with anybody's uh, with anybody's clipboard yet. I'm looking forward. And by the way, every time you copy something in the clipboard, you have to send me the update every time you do that. So I'm still working on that. Somebody's going to do that, and it's not going to be good. On, on second thought, don't send me anything. I changed my mind. I don't want it. No, please don't. Um, let's keep going through uh, the questions that we have. To This one's uh, from Shy Guy. 380 me too, shy guy, uh, who says, I got a bachelor's in applied computer science. Good for you. Have been working in IT for almost a year. Even better. Uh, that's an interesting switch, by the way. How? And I'm. this is a follow-up to your question before I've answered it, which I'm not sure is allowed, but but we're going to do it anyway. Uh, you got a computer si an applied computer science degree, but you've been working in IT. How did that happen? Because obviously those are two different things. Um, the question, though, is, is it still worth getting the A-plus certification from CompTIA, or should I look to earn something else? Um, this, is, this is one of those where uh, it really depends on what you want to do with your career. If you've already been working in IT for almost a year, you probably have the fundamental knowledge you need that that is really contained within the A-plus exam. Now, obviously, there's there's probably things in A-plus you have not covered during that year, granted. Uh, but the, the real question is, what do you want to do next? What's your next job going to be? Or where would you like your next job to be? Do you want to work for someone doing Windows administration, Linux administration, networking, security, databases, data center management, um, cloud-based infrastructures? What do you want to do? So when you start deciding what your next step is going to be, you need to look at all of the jobs in your area that are similar to that position that you think you would qualify for. How many employers are asking for an A+. Plus? How many employers are asking you for Security Plus? How many employers are asking for an Azure or an AWS cert? How many employers are looking for Cisco or Microsoft? So there's no single answer to this, as you can already tell, but... It's one where you have to now do this extra work. I'm giving you homework. So now you have to go out 
and do a little bit of polling. You should be the most familiar person with the job market in your area for the jobs that would apply to you than anyone else. And if you go through and create a spreadsheet for this and you've listed out their requirements for education, that you've listed out their certification requirements, and you've listed out what technologies they would like you to have, you should start to see at least maybe similarities or differences between all of these different companies and all of these different positions. So they may, you may find that none of them are asking for A plus because you're trying to get a job doing Windows administration or Linux administration. They already know they're going to be hiring people that have a foundation similar to what somebody would have received if they had their A+. Plus. So maybe that's not as important to them as a Linux Plus certification, as a Microsoft certification, as a Cisco certification. So it just depends to make that happen. So I would highly recommend you look at your career path. This is one that's it's difficult. You kind of have to sit down and think, what do I want to do next? What interests me? It's, I've been a year in IT. Um, do I want to do something with this computer science degree I got? Do I want to move back over to programming? Or I really like IT. Maybe I want to learn more about Linux. Maybe uh, the mobile applications and managing mobile apps and, and mobile systems is more my speed. Maybe I like databases. Maybe I prefer networking. You know, All of those are going to have different requirements. So I don't have an answer for you other than you're the one that has to find the answer. So it's going to be different for everyone. Make sure you go have a look at all of those different options that are available out there. It's it's sometimes more of a challenge to find those, but it can be very, very useful to get a feel for what jobs may be out there and available. In fact, you may be looking at the jobs and thinking, I want to go into cybersecurity, whatever that is. And you go out and you look at all the jobs associated with IT security in your area. And then you realize, oh, wait. They want extensive networking knowledge. They want extensive knowledge of operating systems. I don't have that yet. Maybe that's my step after this one. So you may be able to change the, the cards on the table a little bit, move around where things happen to be. Uh, it's a balancing act between what you're interested in versus what somebody's willing to hire you for. And that's the real key. So please have a look at those and get a feel for what makes sense for you so that you can then start building a portfolio, a technical portfolio of the things these employers are looking for. And that's going to help you during the process of looking for that new job. It may be a job within your existing organization, or it may be a job outside your organization. You know, we often say in these study groups that we run on kind of a three-year plan in IT. Uh, that tends to be the way we do it, is that we'll get a job, we'll stay in an organization three years, maybe we move up a little bit or move around into different departments within that organization. But in three years, you're at a point where you're you're sort of maxing out your knowledge in your little particular area, your your niche that you've carved out there in that organization. And now you'd like to move up to the next level the problem is that companies don't tend to pay much when you move to that next level if you stay within the same company. But if you go to an external company, you might have more options available. In fact, you usually have more options available for an additional pay bump. So that's usually what we'll do is we'll stay three years. We'll go to a different company. Sometimes we'll stay there three years and move back to our original company at even more money. It happens all the time. I'm a good example because I've worked on the same company uh, twice before. Um, was there a big pay bump? No, there wasn't in that case, but it does happen. There are stories for me. No, for you. Yes. Uh, there was a different set of situations, different, different scenario. There's always, there's always variables. There's always an X factor. There's always something going on that you have to consider. In my case, there was a lot of things I had to consider just doing constant managing of where I am, where I want to live, what options I want to have available. And when you're working for a manufacturer, especially one based out of California, you're pretty much mobile. So in my particular job, I was traveling. I leave on Monday. I come back on Friday. Uh, my family never got to see me during the week. They'd see me on the weekends. Uh, that Sometimes that's good. Sometimes not so good. So you have to balance out where the advantages and disadvantages of that might be. Uh, that's probably why I do what I do now, because I don't leave on Monday and I don't come back on Friday. I'm here you know, seven days a week, whether the family likes it or not. So 
that works out. Thankfully, they like it. So that that's where we where we are, and how we're working with this. And that's uh, uh, to to fill in a little more of these things and what they're doing. Um, the the shy guy who asked the question says, "I manage technology for a K through twelve, which is uh, way more than you may think." Um, there's a whole conversation going on. If you're watching this video, you can watch the chat replay and get more information out of that. Um, but that's that is a th what I find interesting about K through 12 is it is a such a unique niche. I, it's similar to if you work in a hospital, if you work for manufacturing, if you work for power distribution, if you work for transportation. There there are many similarities across all of those different vertical markets, but there's also a lot of differences. You imagine the requirements you have in a hospital versus the requirements you have for a K through 12 very different and very unique. The things you do in a K-12, probably not used in a hospital. The things specific to a hospital, you're definitely not doing in a K-12. through So that's a really good example of how getting a niche somewhere might allow you to jump to another K-12, through or it might allow you to move into more of a corporate environment, maybe a state and local government environment. Maybe you move to federal government because you have at least some government in your back pocket. Um, that's the, the idea anyway. And I think that's one that gives you at least some flexibility in making those things happen. I think if you're in the K through 12 and I've, I've worked with so many different technologists in K 12, um, and, and seen the things that they work with, it is a unique environment with, uh, from a security perspective, enormous challenges. And we were tasked in many ways to implement some of these more advanced firewall technologies into schools to prevent some of these security concerns. So if you wanted to, if you've been told you need to turn off TikTok while at school, you just say your next generation firewall, no TikTok, and that's it. It's done. Uh, maybe it's a way that you're looking for VPNs. Maybe you're tracking different apps. Maybe you're looking for malware. Maybe you want to filter out URLs. These are things that are important in a K through 12. But if you go to a corporation, maybe they're not so focused on filtering you from going to sites, but more interested in identifying malicious software that may be com coming from those locations. So that's another example of how it's slightly the same, but slightly different depending on the vertical that you're in. We're, we all call ourselves IT technologists, but... If you worked in a hospital, I guarantee you, you have much more knowledge on proximity-based authentication, high-speed networking, especially as it deals with images, and a unique perspective to embedded operating systems, especially those that are inside of our medical devices. Well, those are things I didn't have to worry about when I worked for an insurance company. You know, you don't have to worry about the MRI machine and how it works and how we transfer files because we didn't have one at the at the life insurance company. You know, we just we printed things and mailed them to people. It's insurance is interesting because you don't actually make anything. You're you're a bet. You're a, you're a bookie. You're you're hedging bets and making bets. That's what insurance is. So it was very interesting environment versus some of the other organizations I would work in. Some of the, the best places I've ever stopped in and looked at their networks. I've seen networks from many different companies, the largest companies in the world, the largest financial organizations in the world. Uh, but some of the most fun have been places where they make something. So I've been to breweries that are extensively uh, built on technology. And it's interesting to go behind the scenes and see how all of this equipment connects together and how you manage it with these softwares and operating systems that commonly we use, you know, the same thing I'm using to do a, 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 a crude MS paint picture is the same operating system I'm using to control millions of dollars of equipment that is used to, uh, to package beer. You, know, you just don't think about that. Or even better, I was in a, a nuclear power plant. So the same things that we're using to monitor our networks for bandwidth utilization at a life insurance company is the same thing we're using to monitor the network on these critical networks and systems inside of a nuclear power plant. Uh, I've had experiences where I've had to take care and repair systems that were inside of the county jail. That's a completely different set. I've had to fix the machine that runs the DNA tests. So those are the same but different. 
So that's the kind of thing you're going to run into is the same but different. Um, have a look at what options are available to you. Don't limit yourself. If you see a position available at the local uh, uh, nuclear power plant, go for it. You're absolutely qualified to work on those networking systems. You're absolutely qualified to work in a transportation company, in a life insurance company, at a brewery. You absolutely are. There will be small things that are unique to that particular environment, but you can pick them up very quickly. So don't limit yourself to just K through 12 unless you really, really like K through 12. And uh, as I come from a family of, of educators, um, my mom worked uh, in, in, as a high, high school teacher and then worked in the, uh, the, the county office for all of the school systems, uh, the schools in that school system in that county. Uh, my dad was Department of Education. So the idea of education is one that has been in our family for a very long time, but it, it's not limited to that. Because there's ways to educate and ways to integrate these systems regardless of what type of networks you might have. So uh, I, don't, I don't limit myself through K through 12, and I absolutely would love to get a K through 12 position. So both of those could be true at the same time. Very, very, very good point uh, to make, and thank you for that question. Um, let's ask, let's see what other questions have popped up. If you would like to ask a question, I'm monitoring the chat that is in our live stream. So either go to the YouTube where we have this video, there's a chat right next to you. Or if you're on professormesser.com slash live, there's a chat on the same page. It's the same chat. I'm looking at those as they go by. Uh, this is a popular question from less is more who says, any tips on searching for a work-from-home help desk type job after getting A-plus certified? One thing that I have noticed, and I do watch this and see what the what's really happening in the world, obviously, uh, two years ago, everything was work from home. We were working from home everywhere. That's what we wanted. Can you work from home? Because everybody's working from home. Uh, we'll just send you stuff to your home. We'll get on the Zoom call. Everybody will work from home. We even came up with new ways to work from home, which was kind of kind of unusual to be in a case where we had to implement things like monitoring software and additional security controls and VPN configurations and so many other things to people who are working at home. But what you notice now is now there's more people at, a, a, at work. They've gone to an office. So the jobs are slowly, maybe not even slowly, but are quickly migrating away from work at home. Where we really start to see work at home now is for the second and third tier technologists because they're sitting at a desk all day, answering the phone, uh, remotely logging into a device that's not even in the same building that they're in anyway, if not the same city or in some cases the same country. So they're not leaving their desk wherever they happen to be. So they were able to make a justification that says, well, if I go to that desk in your office, I'm doing the same thing as sitting at this desk in my office. There's no difference. Why don't I just stay here? And it's a it's a it's a perk. It's a bonus for these people who uh, are doing that job that they don't have to go into an office every day and make the commute and spend the time in their car and pay the gas and do all of those things associated with it. They can stay at their home in their their office that they built up and they're able to do the same job in some some cases do it even better and more conveniently. Um, so I see this changing. So it's it's very quickly changed back to everybody being in an office. That's certainly not a universal truth, but it is one that is increasingly the the first tier is now somewhere where they are centrally managed in a building. Um, but there are jobs out there. They will say work from home or they'll say remote access. You just have to make sure that things are vetted properly. Many, many stories uh, out there on the Internet of people that said, I just accepted a job. It was 100 percent work from home. And now the CEO came out yesterday after I've been here a week and said, guess what? We're now everybody's coming into the office and they've changed their policy. So these things happen. So at that point, you have to make a decision. Do I stay in this position and go into the office or do I look for another job that might be remote? And we'll have to see what that turns out to be. And it's in my case, my last half of my career, the first half of my career, I worked in an office somewhere um, or, or worked out of an office somewhere. I went to at least an office once a day and then would travel around when I was field service. Or when I worked for the life insurance company, you'd go to a building every day. 
I wake up in the morning, I drive to the building, I'd work in the building, five o'clock, I would leave the building. So that that was the normal get up and work and go home type scenario. The second half of my career, I worked as a systems engineer for a company based out of California and many different companies based out of California. Um, when I hopped from company to company, I hopped in Silicon Valley. But as a systems engineer, I would wake up on a Monday and I'd go visit customers. So I would hop in a car or I'd get on a plane and I would go visit customers at their facility. And then I'd go to a hotel at night and then wake up the next day and go to another set of three or four customers, then wake up the next day and see another three or four customers and so on until Friday hit and then I'd go home. That's a little bit different of a travel scenario, but you're not going into the same office every day. So did I have a home office? I did. Was I ever in it? I was not. <laughs> Very rarely. Most of the time you do spend one day a week at that office at home when you're in that type, particular role. Uh, I don't know. I guess during the 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 shutdowns and during the, the COVID times, I would imagine that uh, that was all work from home as well. And now we're starting to get back out because I think you you connect with people better when you're in front of them. You can understand the problems they're having when you're in front of them. You can take them to lunch and talk into more detail about what, the, what they want to accomplish and what would be successful in this project. So uh, being in person has its advantages. But being away in a remote scenario certainly works for technicians, troubleshooting, uh, roles where you're never going to leave your desk anyway. Sure, there's jobs out there. They're just a lot harder to find these days. So absolutely go look from help desk jobs. A little more difficult. That first tier becomes more challenging to find work from home jobs. But there are some out there, usually with the larger companies. Because the larger companies don't want to pay for you to come into an office and sit there and breathe the air and take up space. They would rather not pay for you to be there and have you at home. And in a way, it helps them financially. Um, plus, they can decide how they want to distribute people and what they want you to do without having to worry about where you're geographically located. So that's good, too. Let's keep going with the questions that have come in. Uh, let's find some uh, good ones that are here. Um, there are some, this is a pretty good one. This is a good one to at least uh, consider if we are someone who's looking at certifications. Uh, Resby asks, can you please provide more information regarding CISSP certification? I have an ME cybersecurity and three years security experience with AWS. That's pretty good. What benefits can I get from this cert? The CISSP is, I guess what you would call the sort of the gold standard for security certifications. Now, that's not saying it's a security certification for all certifications, but for people that are trying to get an IT security position, CISSP is certainly one of the most popular and has been for years, probably most likely because uh, CISSP is one that requires more than you just take a test. You have to uh, qualify yourself. Let's bring up this screen. I think I can bring us over here. You have to qualify your knowledge of CISSP and how you would get certified with that. So you have to not just know the information that's in the exam, which is challenging enough, let, let me tell you. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough exam because it covers a lot of different security things inside of it. But you also have to have some experience in the industry. They require you to have years of experience just to be able to qualify for this certification. And on top of that, you have to be, I believe it's still the way, you have to uh, have someone who has a CISSP has to sponsor you to get the CISSP. So it's almost like a web of trust, if you will. If we can go back to that, if we can go back to Security Plus for a moment, your web of trust. Someone who has the CISSP trusts you. Therefore, ISC Squared, which is the company that manages the CISSP, ISC Squared can now have a certain level of trust for you because an existing CISSP owner uh, or holder now trusts you enough that you should be able to earn the CISSP as well. Um, it is uh, a a very well-known 
certification. So in the industry, it's one that almost everybody is familiar with. And I think it's that requirement of already having industry experience and having that experience vetted by ISC squared and confirmed before you earn that cert means that someone else looking at your CISSP knows you must have had that experience or at least has a very strong trust that indeed you must be qualified if you pass that certification. That is... That's good stuff. That's for someone who's doing, uh, who's getting into the industry and you want to make an impression on people about your security knowledge. CISSP has traditionally been that cert. But to get to that level, we need all of this other knowledge as well. And that's where Security Plus and the CASP Plus and the CISA Plus and Pentest Plus and other certifications come in because you can't just jump into the CISSP. You need years of experience to be able to even pass, even to even earn the cert. You have to have that experience. They're not going to give it to you unless you have the experience. So how do you get the experience? You build up to it. So that's what I would recommend if you're someone working through that process is building up to that. I think that's a good one to, to work through. Um, other questions in the chat. I'm going to keep flipping through some of the other ones that are here. Um, so we've talked a little bit about third party and other types of certifications from CompTIA. This is a good follow up to that, which is so I'm getting my A plus network plus and security plus to get the stack. And I guess that's the one if, if you want to get the trifecta and the one that people are really looking for. And that is a good combination. If you look at uh, job postings, they usually want at least one of those, so and, and often more than one. So getting your A-plus, Network-plus, and Security-plus, it's a great foundation. It's a good primer into learning uh, and just setting yourself up to learn more going forward. And that's really what this question is, which is, what certs do you recommend after getting these? The good part about the IT industry, for the most part, and about certifications in general, is that it's hard to find a bad cert. There are certainly a couple out there. CEH. But other than, than maybe one or two that are out there, most certifications are pretty good. Um, and so if you're getting a cert from Microsoft, from AWS, from Cisco, from Red Hat, you know, all of, and, and then again from CompTIA with their CASP and their CISA Plus and their Pentest Plus and the other, the Data Plus and some of the newer ones, newer technologies they have coming down the line. Those certifications are all good. But which one should you take? This goes back to that question that was asked earlier about I've been in IT a year. What do I do next? Well, I don't have the answer to that because I'm not you. What do you want to do next? That's the great thing about IT is I started out in this industry as a field service technician. So if I didn't change, if I never leveled up from there, I would still be installing hard drives. I would still be installing SSDs or memory. I would still be installing and troubleshooting printer problems and plugging in printer cables, which is great way to learn the technologies, by the way. And I think that really positioned me well for my next, for my level up. But you've got to at some point decide what do you want to do? I decided I didn't want to drive around the streets of South Florida every day as a field service technician. Uh, I-95 and 826 were driving me crazy. So I thought, how can I get off the turnpike and instead be in a building? And so I looked for a job at a corporation where it was more professional, where they had specific hours from 9 to 5 or whatever it happened to be. Um, and that allowed me to focus my efforts on individual organizations within my local geographic area. I looked around for jobs that were available and decided to get a desk job, which was more of a corporate help desk job. That's right. I leveled up to help desk. That's that's how low I was on the, on the totem pole is I was down at the field service technician and I leveled up to get to help desk, thankfully, gladly. And, and it was one of the best decisions I ever made because then I was able to broaden my scope past the world of field service. And now I'm looking at 
uh, network operating systems and desktop operating systems and networking protocols in general and security concerns and antivirus and uh, email and databases and uptime and availability and metrics and monitoring and wide area networks and routers and CSUD issues and it really expanded my scope of technology to things I not, didn't even know existed. And then when you really start learning about things that up to that point you did not even know were real things, now that's that's a great job to be in. That is that is really a fulfilling position to be in. I'm learning new things. That's the real focus behind many of us because we want to fix the problems. We're we are we're we look at these problems as quizzes, as as issues to be solved, as a problem. So how do I put this back together? Uh, or how do I pull out all of the different Jenga pieces so that it's all now fixed and working the way it should be. And unless you have a knowledge of how it was constructed or how it operates, you're not able to do that particular job. So moving into a corporate help desk was fantastic for me because it gave me an opportunity to learn new things, uh, understand new operating systems. At the time, uh, running Windows in a networked environment was a relatively... Um, new things. So I got into the details of Windows and understanding how it is deployed, how you can automate the deployment of Windows, how you can uh, store things in different places, things that normally now we just do as part of our Active Directory, and that's how Windows works. But at the time, that wasn't actually how it was done. So we were at the very beginning of finding how do you deploy it this way? And then where are its shortcomings and how can we fix those shortcomings? Oh, Active Directory. Let's implement Active Directory and now let's do this. So we were able to sort of build this as we go. All of that technology I did with Windows still applies except with newer technology today. So if you are working in an environment and you're getting into cloud, it's the same problem I had back then. Cloud is relatively new. There's new technologies in cloud that are being rolled out all the time, new ways to automate it, new ways to integrate cloud-based technologies, new way to connect different cloud infrastructures together, new ways to maintain the security across those different infrastructures, even from different providers. There's similar problems that have to be solved. So that's what you should do is think about what do you want to do next and then go do it. The good part about this is there's no bad decision. If you're interested in Linux, go get some Linux certifications. Go get some Linux knowledge. Build out your own Linux systems. Build your own Linux services. Put them on a system. Break them. Fix them. Break them. Fix them. And become an expert in the management of those Linux environments. I guarantee you somebody's going to hire you because everyone has Linux. There are jobs everywhere for Linux administrators. And if you like it, that's a perfect niche to roll down into. But you may get into that three years later think, all right, Linux was great, uh, but I've, I've learned everything I want to learn on Linux. I'd like to learn the same information I learned on Linux, but on Windows. So let's move over to be a Windows administrator, and you can do that. Or maybe in Linux you realize the way that Linux systems are networked together is fascinating to me. How can I design and deploy network systems like this? How can I build out my own network infrastructure? And how can I do it both in physical devices and in the cloud? There's a whole set of jobs available for you right there. You just pivot and go into networking. So most of IT is pivoting and going, pivoting and moving forward. So you would be in the help desk, you pivot to Linux, move forward with Linux, then pivot to networking, go forward with networking, pivot to security, go for, you see how this works. You just find the thing you're interested in doing with the organization that you're interested in doing it for. That's the thing you want to focus on. Sometimes you make great decisions about that. Sometimes you don't make great decisions about that. I've made plenty of bad decisions. Uh, decisions about my career throughout my career. Uh, and I've made great decisions about my career throughout my career. So even though uh, did some did some not great things with my career early on, you figure out where you went wrong. You realize looking back, oh, wait, that was a red flag. How did I not see the red flag? It was a big red flag. They were waving it in front of me at the interview. It said on the flag, do not take this job. I didn't even see it. Uh, but you learn that after a while, and then you go to the next interview after that and realize, why is why are they waving this big flag in the middle of my interview? Oh, wait, I saw it. No, thank you. We're going to go with someone else. That happens all the time. So you get, a, you get a feel for this after a while. When I was working for these companies out of uh, Silicon Valley, 
This was in kind of the internet boom time, which can we really say that's even over? Um, the the acquisitions, the mergers that were happening during that time frame were ridiculous. They were many and varied. And I think when I worked at Network Associates, I think we may have acquired about 10 different companies in the few years that I worked there. Um, that that was remarkable to be with a company that's making that many changes so quickly. Um, how'd it turn out? Well, they're back to being McAfee. So maybe it didn't turn out so great. Um, but at the time, that was what people were doing. They were all buying different companies and sort of shoring up the overall corporate and technical focus of the organization. And it worked great. It was fine. That was that was a good way to do it. Acquisition is certainly a great way to to build out a company very quickly. They just did a lot of it very quickly um, and ran into some problems. And eventually, uh, Network Associates divested McAfee away and Network General back away. So it was sort of like a, a marriage. We changed our name. And then there was a divorce. And we changed our name back to what it was originally. And we just would all pretend it never, ever happened. And that's and we all went our separate ways. Ultimately, Network General uh, was acquired by NetScout, and I think that's where they stay today. Uh, it's all just NetScout now, based out of uh, the Boston area. So that was an interesting change too. Working for a company out of California, where you could travel without a jacket, um, and then now we were acquired by a company in the Boston area, um, and it was November. Don't know if you've been up to Boston in the November, December time frame. Not exactly balmy. Uh, a little cold out, a little bit chilly. Um, that was the one where growing up in Florida, um, I would go up to corporate and they were putting these huge sticks in the parking lot with the orange things on the top, like six foot high. I'm like, what are the sticks for? And everybody, of course, who lives in a area of the world where it snows knows exactly what those are for that's so you can know where the the snow gets piled up you know where the curbs are so they know where to where to get rid of the snow in the parking lot me in florida i don't know i don't care never never heard of snow before what is this snow thing you think uh, you're talking about i'm not i am not aware of this snow um that that's one where you start to realize wow there's a it's a different world so there was a, a sort of a cultural change in the organization that happens so now you get to decide, now do I move with the corporate change? Do I level up within the organization? Do I level up outside the organization? Do I go work somewhere uh, based out of the Caribbean? Maybe, <laughs> maybe that's, maybe is that what we do? Uh, whatever makes sense for you. I, cold didn't work with me. Cold, I was allergic to cold, so it didn't work uh, with me okay. So I had to find somewhere warmer to work uh, and it worked out. But there's a job for everyone depending on what you want to do. So my recommendation, what certs I recommend to answer your question, what certs do I recommend after getting your A plus network plus and security plus? I don't care. Find the one that works for you. Find the technology you're most interested in because that's the one you're going to want to work on every day. And you can work on that for years. And by the way, regardless of what you choose, you will be able to use the knowledge you acquire in that particular job for the rest of your IT career, I guarantee you. It's all interconnected. It's all pulls from each other. The things I was working on as a next generation firewall systems engineer, I pulled from knowledge that I learned earning my MCSE from 10 years prior. I say 10, it was probably more. Uh, and that was what got me in that job and allowed me to do things in that job very, very easily because I already knew how Active Directory worked, already knew how to integrate with Active Directory, already knew how to find an Active Directory server based on the DNS that's on the local network. There's things you can plug in and find them very quickly and find the IP addresses. Those things uh, would normally you'd have to learn from the ground up, already knew that. So you're able to build you're not just leveling up your job for a change in pay. You're also bringing with you all of the knowledge that you've accumulated from the previous levels, which is incredibly valuable, not just to you to be able to use this throughout your career, but also to your employer. That's why they hired you after all. That's why they're paying you is because you are this, this uh, knowledgeable in those things. So that's my answer to you, which is I don't have an answer for you. 
you're the one that has to answer it. But hopefully now you've got some ideas on what you can do with that. And uh, uh, since I say you can ask me anything in here, I don't know that I'll answer anything. But in our after show, I try to answer anything. Uh, and Antonio asks, uh, what are my hobbies outside of IT? Um, I, I own this company that uh, creates training materials on the internet, and it takes up all of my time. Literally everything. <laughs> it's, it's just plenty. Um, uh, this is a seven-day-a-week kind of thing. I'm constantly creating content. Uh, as I mentioned in the last study group, I get like an hour or two at night, maybe two hours to be on the Xbox. Just something I can do that's not sitting in my studio and writing content. But most of the time I'm writing content because I want to write content. I would not be doing this if I did not want to do it. Um, this is not something they have to drag me in here every morning. I'm happy to come in here every morning and make this content. And I'm learning things about how to get this into your hands, how to make it easier for you. I'm learning all the time about how to uh, make these training courses the most efficient, the most accurate, and the best form of learning that I can give so that you can earn these certifications because there's a lot riding on them. These certifications are able to give people different lives, not only just getting a new job, but changing your financial future, changing the future of your family. And the reason I know that is because I did it. Uh, there's not a lot of people training in this industry who've been through those trenches, who've gone from the bottom and worked their way up and are able to take that knowledge and put it into the training materials. I would not do this if I did not think there was value behind it. And I think it's more than value. It, it, is, it is really life-changing in what it can provide for your flexibility in your job, for the amount of money you're going to make in your career, and for the type of life you would like to have because there is work-life balance. I know we hear a lot of horror stories all the time about IT, how there's sometimes long hours and, and people that don't treat them well, but that's any job. Quite honestly, if you work for a good company, you work for good managers, you're not going to have that. You have a perfectly reasonable, well-balanced work life, and it's one that everybody can benefit from, not just at your place of work, but your family can benefit as well. That's the real benefit. Um, that's, that's what I would hope for you. And that's what I'm hoping these training courses will do for you. That's the reason we make them. That's the reason we work so hard on them. That's the reason they're published and the reason we do these live streams uh, because it's there. I just want to give it, put it out there, and then what comes of it, we'll, we'll see if people are able to take advantage of these things. But there's, a, there's an opportunity here, and I want as many people as possible who want to grab onto the opportunity and take advantage of it. I'm there, and you got everything you need to be able to make that happen. Well, I think, uh, uh, and now I will finish, this is a good one to finish with, the Chapel of Sanity, which I, I've never been there. So if you have directions, I'd like to, to maybe show up someday. Uh, in the Chapel of Sanity, we have the question, how do I deal with feeling like I'm not smart enough to do this? Well, here's the thing about IT. You are, first, you are smart enough to do this. So let me tell you, if you're in IT, and you already, you already kept up with this so far, you're smart enough. You're going to do fine. The problem we run into in IT is there's no way to know everything. You know, if you work in a manufacturing job and your job is to make these widgets, you become very, very well versed in how to make widgets. And you're, you know everything there is to know about the widget. And you know how uh, when the machine's going bad, you can hear when the machine's going bad. When the machine is working well, you can see when the machine is working well. You know it. Uh, that, that level of imposter syndrome we have in IT, though, is just a normal part of your walking around. It really is. Because there's no way that me, you, or anyone else knows everything about everything in IT. You will never know everything there is to know about everything in IT. And that's why what you end up doing in IT is you surround yourself with very knowledgeable people in your organization and hopefully people that have different strengths than you do. I used to work in a place and I was I was the protocol person. I knew I spent so much time working for a company that made protocol analyzers that I was the de facto protocol guy. Someone else in our organization had tons of time with a high-end ISP. That was my BGP guy. 
Whenever I got a BGP question and it was a little outside the scope of BGP that I'd done so far, I could go talk to my BGP guy. If I got a, a very advanced IPsec question um, that went beyond my implementations of IPsec that I'd done, there was somebody I was working with that was an IPsec expert. And I could talk to them about, hey, have you ever set one up before that had this type of asymmetric routing? And how would I circle that back? And they go, oh, you want to do NAT here and you want to configure these? They knew. So you don't have to know everything. In fact, you're not going to know everything. And here's the thing, nobody expects you to know everything. That's the part they don't tell you, though, is everybody knows that you don't know everything. What they expect you to be able to do, though, is use all of the resources available at your fingertips to find the information you need. And in some cases, you end up training yourself in the things you don't know, especially if you're responsibility for a particular niche or a particular service, or perhaps you're the new guy if I can bring this all the way back, maybe you're the new guy that just got hired and they bring you into the data center and they put you in front of this machine that looks like it's about 10 years old and it has a sheet of paper on the front of it and that paper says, do not power down, do not restart. And they say to you, we want to know what's on this machine. We want to know how it's running. We want to know if we restart it. Is it going to restart? And we want you to make sure that it can be restarted. And we want to remove this piece of paper. That's your first job. Go. Okay. Well, of course, you know nothing about the system already. Are you, are you smart enough to do it? Yes, you are. Do you currently know anything about the system? You do not. So now all of these things you've learned are going to be put to the test. Let's start doing an inventory of the system. What's on the hard drive of the system? Uh, are, we able to are we able to connect to the system and copy files off of it? Can I make an image of the system sort of offline? Is it really just running an executable? Is it a Windows service? Is it its own operating system? Is it running Linux? Is it a daemon running in Linux? What is it? We don't even know. So now you have to go figure it out. And you just start gathering the information. And by the way, after a week or two or a month of doing this, and you've collected all of this information, now you're the smartest one in the company when it comes to that computer. Nobody else in the company knows more about that system than you do. You just went from being the not smart enough person in the room to the person who knows more than anybody else in the room. This is a common theme in your IT career. As you spend more time focusing on these very specific niches, and I highly recommend you do this, find the niche, drill down into the niche, be the service expert, be the, the, knowledge, the most knowledgeable person on that particular product or service, and you now become the expertise. You now have a set of knowledge that nobody else has that you're now able to then leverage into your next position. So anytime you are wondering, are you smart enough for this? That's not the right question because you're absolutely smart enough for this or else you would not be here right now. The question is, have I learned enough about this? And the answer is probably no. So there's your opportunity. Let's go learn about this technology. And there's places all over the internet to learn. Uh, hopefully this is one, but now you can go even further to be able to do those, those types of jobs. I think if you're someone in IT, this will be a common theme, not just when you're starting off. I finished my career as uh, working for this amazing, dynamic uh, startup called Palo Alto Networks. Nobody even heard of this product before. It was a technology that was different than anything else in the industry. I didn't know anything about it. Nobody knew anything about it. The only people who knew about it are the ones that made it. They were just in a small room in Palo Alto. So now you become an expert in this technology and you start deploying it, bringing it out to the field, showing it to people, putting it in and evaluations and implementing it as uh, professional services. That's what I ended up doing. So I was able to throw out lots of Cisco boxes, lots of checkpoint boxes and put something in that was really doing security. That was the important part for me. And I walked into the company not being the smartest person on that product, when I left the company, that I felt like I was an expert on the Palo Alto Networks product and I could use that technology to do anything I would want to do with it. That's, uh, that is what you will find throughout your career, whether you're starting out at the bottom or whether you're one of the highest end uh, technicians, systems engineers, technologists in your particular field, you will constantly be learning. And by the way, there will be new technologies released tomorrow 
that we will all have to read up on. We're all starting from ground zero. We're all trying to figure out the way it operates. We all want to plug it in and use it. At you know, at a certain time, there was no such thing as a web server. So at where do where does the knowledge come from? And that's what we were tasked with. Somebody plopped a, a Unix machine in front of me and says, let's load up a web server and we'll build an app on it that we can look up phone numbers of everybody in the company on a web front end. And the first question we'd ask is, what's a web server? Okay, so there's where your starting point is. Now, of course, we know lots about web servers. I now own my own web servers. And we run them day to day on our, on our Linux devices at ProfessorMesser.com. So you never know where this stuff is going to take you. But it's going to be knowledge that you know nothing about. You're going to learn everything about it. And then you're going to be the expert in it. And then you repeat. So get ready for a, a lifetime of being the dummy and embrace being non-knowledgeable because the sooner you can raise your hand and go hold on i have no idea what you just said there can you rewind that a little bit and explain it slower for someone like me and they'll explain it okay got it now i got it let's continue if you're the person who starts bringing it up you're going to be learning it faster than anyone else so embrace your ignorance uh trust me when you become not afraid to tell people that you don't know it changes what you can do in this industry. It changes your approach to problems and it gets rid of the fear and instead turns it into curiosity. And I think we are often frozen by fear, not just in IT, but sort of in our lives. But if we can embrace the fear, at least the fear of technology and embrace that fear of the unknown and say, well, I don't know now, but, and I certainly don't want to touch it because if I do touch this machine, I'll break it, but give me a day or two, give me a week with this box let me figure out what's going on. Let me become knowledgeable of what's in here, and we'll do exactly what you want to do. That's your approach to IT. It never changes. So just get used to it. Enjoy the ride. Enjoy what IT is going to bring to you and your family and your career. And everything else, trust me, is going to take care of itself. Well, I think that's a good place to stop. Thank you so much for being with us today. We appreciate you being here in the first hour. We appreciate you being here at all. So thank you for your support of what we do online. Thank you for your support during these live streams. We love doing these. So we hope you come back and join us again and again. You can always find us on the calendar at professormesser.com slash calendar when the next live event is going to be. And if you have any questions or anything else in the meantime, come visit us on our Discord. That's where I'll be at professormesser.com slash Discord. Give us a thumbs up if you like the video. Thanks for joining us. We will see you next time on the A plus study group. Thanks, everybody.